And uh, there we go. The gorgeous Tammy Finnegan, Solar Warden, nice to have you both here. And there's Sean Newkirk, everyone. He likes a good wave. Make sure you wave back to him. Welcome to our chat room, Sean. Appreciate that. Kimberly Joe, welcome to the SOR chat room. Thank you for joining us as we continue on here. Uh, Reverend Keith, amen to you, my friend. GF, 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 G, good to see you, buddy. Uh, by the way, your tweets today, I meant to message you. You were fantastic, by the way. In uh, catching that little snafu there by uh, Project, uh, whatever his name is, Disclosure Dude, UFO Jesus. So good job there. Good job. Gorgeous Pam McSee, good to see you. We're running out of time here. And who else do we got? My brother Eugene. Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. If you're in Austin, Texas, find Uncle Dale. Rub his power stash for good luck on Black Friday. The gorgeous and talented Kira. Game vet. Good to see you. Snakes on a UFO. Rock and roll. Let's horns up. Let's rock this right now. the mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old Navy the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking up Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Tonight, we take a look into something that is very personal to me, and that is Canada's role in ufology. What has Canada been hiding? What are they hiding for their American neighbors to the south? Why have they been so quiet when it comes to the Uf UAP story? I almost said UFO there. I could have, because it's still the right term to use, but we'll use UAP in that sense. Tonight... From Vice Magazine and Vice Online, contributing journalist Daniel Otis is with us. He is one of the real smart guys who has really taken this story by really the, the nuts and bolts of everything on what's happening in Canada. Why? Because no other journalist in Canada, outside of myself, is actually doing this. This is an important story. This is a story that affects Canadians, Americans, and everybody on this planet. But why has Canada been silent? And we're going to find out from Daniel tonight, as we have him for the first 90 minutes of this show. Then John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report is going to join us for the remainder of tonight's show. And we're going to have a great time. Daniel Otis, thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. You and I have been talking for a number of months here, but this is the first time we're able to hook up on the show. I apologize for keeping you up late, <laughs> but I'm glad you're here, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Daniel, you are a journalist by trade, and, and this is a discussion that I always love to have because, you know, when it comes to the UFO story, a lot of our listeners feel ripped off in the mainstream media, and we they feel ripped off at the questions that are asked, the stories that are coming out. Everything seems so narrative in the way it's going. For you... Uh, as a journalist who's decided to cover this story, what made you step into this realm, man? I mean, this is a dangerous realm for any <laughs> freelance or mainstream journalist to take on. Uh, I think like with any story I've ever really uh, taken a dive into, it starts with personal curiosity. Um, I had been aware of like the New York Times coverage from 2017, but the real spark for me was in uh, April 2020 when the Pentagon confirmed the veracity of the 
three uh, UFO videos that were uh, published in the New York Times story. And I'm going to say UFO because that's the term that's used in the official Canadian documentation. Um, so it, it was that, you know, seeing that uh, official confirmation that these were, you know, real videos of unknown objects sort of got me very interested in the topic. You know, I, I sort of absorbed as much as I could, read what I could, watched what I could. And uh, then I started digging for Canadian data, um, you know, by digging through public records and filing access to information requests, Canadian data started coming in. And when I, you know, started Google and searching uh, some stuff, seen, uh, you know, it just seemed obvious to me that uh, this was a journalistic path I had to take. You know, for, for this story to come out in Canada, the news outlets have been running this, whether it's Global National, CTV, CBC, or papers like the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and many other big uh, name tabloids that are out there. But the one thing that always kind of grabbed me and it really, really brought ire to my, to my thinking, man, was it was all from an American angle. We never had any journalists in Canada asking the Canadian side of this story. I think it was bad journalism, maybe bad editing. I don't know what the story is. Why do you think that Canadian journalists have been willing to cover this story, but not from a Canadian angle? Well, I, I, I think, you know, once the topic is validated uh, in American outlets uh, that are reputable, like the New York Times, CNN, et cetera, I think it sort of allowed Canadian editors to say, OK, this is an authentic story. But you're right, um, you know, for the most part, with a few exceptions, uh, but for the most part, Canadian media outlets aren't touching Canadian data which is unfortunate because there's a great deal of it, you know, uh, official reports from professional pilots, official reports from members of the Canadian forces, uh, entire Air Force and Canadian NORAD procedures on what to do with UFOs. Yet uh, for largely Canadian media is silence. Um, you know, I, I, I can sit here and try and guess why the case that is, what, uh, why that's the case. But uh, really, I think it's, perhaps just not seen still as a as a valid topic in in many eyes i think uh canadian media on the whole with some exceptions but on the whole tends to be a little more uh conservative in terms of the types of things that are covered than uh in the us you know uh the new york times uh, again took a very very bold move by opening the door for serious UFO journalism in December 2017, you know, there still hasn't been too much of that kind of effort in Canada. Um, I, I, I hope that changes. I, I hope that's thawing. I hope that, you know, coverage of American developments on the subject will lead Canadian editors to uh, see that there is, or perhaps search out the Canadian data. It's, it's there to find. Um, I wish I could answer your question as to well, why. I'd love to see more coverage. There was two instances that really drove me nuts. One was from the CTV, Canadian Television Network, when they interviewed for 14 minutes Chris Mellon in Washington, D.C. And not one question was asked about Canada, yet we were asking about little green men running around and, and flying on the earth. The second one was weeks after that, the CBC actually flew a camera crew and their Washington Bureau journalist to uh, Wyoming to interview Lou Elizondo. And in that 20-minute interview, nothing was asked about Canada. And Lou as we know, because I've asked him, knows that Canada is highly involved in the UFO phenomena. And it just baffles me that you have these Washington Bureau reporters who are, whose job is to give the Canadian angle, that's what they get paid to do, the Canadian angle to what's happening in the United States they cover the UFOs, they spend taxpayer money in the CBC's case to actually fly a crew to interview Elizondo, and nothing is mentioned about Canada. I find that baffling and wrong, and it I'm sorry, I'm passionate about it, it upsets me. 
I, I feel similarly, but you know, you never know what was lost on the editing floor. You never know what was said off the record and couldn't be, uh, you know, run. You just don't know. But like, frankly, uh, you know, it, in my eyes, I think like yours, when you, when you look at mainstream Canadian media outlets, they're just not taking this as a, as seriously as, you know, media outlets are in the United States. But, you know, they're not hopefully that any- changes. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, I'm putting information out there. Um, it's the data is there, right? Like it's there. It's there. All right. So, so let's talk about the positive here for a second. You have really tackled this story. And, and I'm proud to say you're probably the only journalist that I have noticed in Canada who is really taking this story by the horns and ran with it. And I think it's wonderful. And I think what you are doing is phenomenal journalism. I think, uh, you know, you and I have talked numerous times. Let's let's disclose it to the public. You and I have talked mm-hmm. numerous times. I've shared some, some very important uh, um, uh, people with you that we're going to keep off the record. You have done the exact same thing with me. We've developed a, a good working, a healthy working relationship. Even though you got your business, I have my business. They're not really cross-referencing, you know, but the big thing is we're working on it. We're communicating together on it. And I want to bring that up for our audience so they don't think that I'm sitting here, you know, trying to pl- pl- play and say something that I don't know when I may know. You know what I'm saying? But for you grabbing this and being really the only journalist across this massive country covering this story in depth, what has been the reaction, not only from the public, but your colleagues for you taking on this story? Um, Overwhelmingly positive, to be frank. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you can hear there's sirens and things. There's a, I think that I can hear outside my window. There's someone on a loudspeaker telling someone to get off a roof. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Toronto. Um, yeah. This is, this is downtown Toronto for all of you. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, 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 the reaction has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, I, like, look at this. I'm, I'm speaking to you. I've done, you know, well over a dozen appearances on podcasts, radio, TV. Uh, th- there's such an appetite for uh, new and fresh content uh, on the subject. And I, I think the public is kind of starved for new information. You know, so much of uh, UFO media is just you know, looking at different angles at the same sort of incidents, the same sort of data again and then again and again. So there's, I think, a real thirst for new information. So, you know, when I'm putting out these stories that are based on access to information requests and the, you know, cr- reports from, you know, credible observers like pilots, uh, you know, the journalists uh, that I speak to, they're, everybody's very encouraging, very encouraging. It, it, it's been uh, it, it, which has made it for me, you know, really exceptionally fulfilling um, just to see that I'm putting out these stories and that there is a reaction to all of them that, uh, you know, people are encouraging. It, it really keeps me wanting to, you know, keep doing more. All right. What has been, though, the reaction from those people? Yes, they're liking what they're doing, but but are they realizing that this phenomena is real and we need to start paying attention to it? Uh, well, I, I certainly hope so. I think that's this sort of uphill battle we have in, in Canadian media as opposed to the United States. You know, the sort of major media outlets in the United States, I think uh, the editorial departments there accept as fact that something is happening and it is real. You know, uh, in Canada, unfortunately, when you see segments on the subject on, you know, TV news, you know, half the time there are references of little green men, you know, they make it silly. It's still taboo. I still think in Canada, we have work to do to convince people that, you know, of the veracity of this topic, that it is real, that people do see things that are anomalous, and that that's worthy of, you know, a deeper look investigation instead of uh, ridicule or dismissal. But what amazes me is Canada has had four coins now made by the Canadian Mint, (laughs) <laughs> about ufos they sell out within days not and sometimes hours and we have some incredible stories of crashes of experiences whether it's shag harbor whether it's falcon lake 
And yet, none of these people, and journalists who I'm calling people here, even seem to understand that there is a true history of ufology in Canada. Well, and the phenomenal thing is so much of that history is available online for the public to sift through. Uh, the National uh, Research Council of Canada was the recipient of uh, UFO reports pretty much throughout the Cold War era. And all of their UFO archives are digitized online by Library and Archives Canada. You can go into this full database and search reports. There's thousands of them, you know, going from the 40s or 50s up until uh, the early 80s. And those, some of those reports are, for, you know, from Canadian military personnel at Canadian military and NORAD bases. So, you know, there is a history of this phenomenon in Canada. And if you want to, you know, look back 70 years, it's, it's there. It's, it's publicly accessible thanks to uh, the folks at Library and Archives Canada, what did, uh, which is a government institution. Changing the topic a little bit, what did you know about UFOs before you decided to delve into this? Uh, well, you know, as a, as a child of the 90s, of course, uh, I was watching the X-Files and, and things like that. But it, for me, it was sort of at a level of entertainment. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't something I, I really began to take seriously, uh, you know, up until, you know, s- some of that groundbreaking New York Times coverage. I'd, I'd even been out camping, you know, in the desert as a, as a much younger man and saw something, you know, buzzing around anomalous that was quite anomalous in its, you know, in its movements. And I, I just put it off to, you know, oh, we're, we're near some sort of, you know, U.S. testing ground. Uh, this was in the deserts of California. I, I didn't really think much of it at all uh, in, until that ground. Oh, we seem to have frozen here for a second, Daniel. We'll wait for your internet there to catch up. But, I mean, I like what he's saying. I really... Breaking your time. There you go. You, you kind of stalled out there for about uh, 10 seconds or so. Where'd you lose me? Uh, <laughs> goodness, when it stalls out, I hit the panic button. Like, what did oh. I do? What did I touch? But... Uh, I, I, I couldn't be closer to the modem right now. <laughs> I know the feeling. I Trust me. Um, I know the feeling. Uh, as I was saying, was it was really the New York Times coverage for me as like working as a professional journalist. It, it, I was aware of sightings. I, I was aware of things that were being produced on it, but you know, unfortunately, I, I didn't take it seriously until you know, really seriously until April of 2020. And interestingly enough, you know, I, I was formerly a staff reporter at the Toronto Star, uh, and which is uh, for the it's a large newspaper here in Canada. And at the time when I was there, there was one case that came up, uh, which will be celebrating its fifth anniversary uh, this Sunday. And that was a Porter Airlines flight. This is a domestic airline that flies uh, across eastern Canada. This was a flight from Ottawa to Toronto. And uh, while over Lake Ontario, it, you know, there was an object in its way. The plane took a nosedive to avoid hitting it. Uh, two flight attendants were injured. And, you know, then the plane landed and the Toronto Star at the time did a story on it. It was one or two stories that were just sort of done as a maybe it was a drone. Who knows? Ha ha. And, you know, it, I, I was sort of kicking myself now because had I had I had the fire to look into the topic back then, I would have been able to uncover, you know, so much more than what was made public at the time. Um, it, it was it was a very interesting case that got documented. Uh, beyond most aviation cases in Canada, precisely uh, because people were injured. But it just, you know, it, it just flew right past me. And yeah, it was uh, the New York Times. I, I really can't emphasize enough the uh, their groundbreaking reporting, how they opened the door for the possibility, not only the possibility of this, but also to allow, you know, myself to even think of this as a, as a topic to tackle, you know, using journalistic methods. You know, I can tell you this. I witnessed a UFO on my patio with three other people. And I actually called up my old radio station. And my good friend John answers the phone. And the first thing he says to me is this. How much have you been uh, drinking, Dave? (laughs) How 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 much pot have you smoked tonight? I'm like, dude, none and none. Like, all I'm asking is, is there people calling into the newsroom to say there's been some weird sightings in the Abbotsford admission area of British Columbia in the lower mainland. And he's like, Nope, why don't you go back to partying, Dave? 
and, and this is a friend of mine who knows that, you know, I'm not going to call up with a BS story. You know, I mean, we worked together for seven years. He knows I know what a story is. And, but that's just the attitude that seems to go around this country where we're not wanting to look into this. We think everybody is a bunch of crackpots who is studying this. The majority of people out there, especially in the journalistic world, don't understand the brilliancy of a lot of the scientists and researchers that are out there. And in, and in Canada alone, when you think of Grant Cameron, Chris Rakowski, Victor Vigiani, and, and many others, Ryan Stacy. As well, and that's a, that's a good new up and comer there. Even though you know, if I know Ryan's probably listening to this, so I I will probably uh, you know get him to smirk when I say that you know I mean the guy hasn't shaved in about three years and he still looks freshly cut. You know, it's terrible. I don't like people like that. They're untrustworthy to me. I, I'm kidding, Ryan. I'm kidding. But I mean, you know who I'm talking about. There's a lot of smart people. You know, going all the way back to Wilbur Smith. You know who 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 are have been covering this topic, and and to the in the darkness almost across this country. Yeah, it, and 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 it has been darkness, and and I think when you know I started diving into this topic and you know trying to you know pull Canadian data you know uh, officially from the military and transportation agencies. You know, when I when I saw that none of this had, you know, penetrated uh, mainstream media, I, I frankly was shocked because a lot of the case data I was pulling, you know, I'm pulling material mostly over the past 20 years. As I mentioned, all that historical Cold War data was there. And, and you asked me how, how sort of my, my peers, uh, my journalism peers, uh, you know, they, they're very encouraging now. But in the early days when I, when I began, you know, a lot of people thought I was a little bit nuts. Um, and but when I started showing them things like, uh, you know, in, intelligence reports from the Air Force about, um, you know, pilots seeing things uh, over Canada, then w once there was that sort of tangible official documentation, like to back up, you know, uh, this stuff, then I, I noticed people's perspective starting to change. And I think that's one thing, you know, my, my reporting is really focused on official procedures and uh, reports from, you know, what we would call, I guess, the most credible observers, you know, police officers, uh, military personnel, professional aviators, people who really have nothing to gain by filing official reports, but actually people who probably only have, you know, things to lose by filing reports in terms of, you know, stigma and ridicule in the workplace. And I, and I, the reason I focus on those reports is, is because I think in the minds of, of people who haven't really delved into this topic, that, you know, these are sort of trustworthy, uniform people uh, who would have no reason to, to make any of this up. So that's, that's sort of been my approach. And, you know, there's so much more, you know, I, I know your show talks about, you know, delves into, you know, experiencers and things like that. You know, we can't even begin to get into that in mainstream Canadian media, I think. The, the main thing, you know, the main mission right now is, is to convince uh, people, you know, across the country that, uh, this is a real topic uh, worthy of, you know, a, a serious look. Um, it, it would be really nice when, once we get there, you know, it, it'll be exciting to see, you know, what other kinds of stories we can tell. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we only got about 45 seconds, Dan, and we got a full hour left with you uh, tonight. And I wish we had longer, but I will make it up and we will do a longer show at a later date because I am looking at, on our YouTube channel, adding a, a Thursday afternoon show, which will be a little bit of a longer format. But we got a lot to cover. When we come back, Dan, you stirred up a little bit of controversy uh, about Chris Rutkowski, not about the man, but about the information that he was getting. I thought this was a very telling story, and my sources in Ottawa stated that they were quite concerned about the story you wrote about that. We're going to talk about this with Daniel Otis, contributing journalist with Vice Magazine, here on Spaced Out Radio, Canada's role in ufology. Where is it? Where does it stand? We're going to jam a bunch of information into your heads over the next 60 minutes with Daniel Otis, and then John Hudson will join us for the next hour. After that, talking UFOs, we'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio here on the Mighty SOR. Stay tuned.
All right, uh, just one uh, quick thing I forgot to tell you earlier. Our audience on YouTube can hear us while we're on break. Hi, everybody on YouTube. (laughs) All right. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah. All right, there we go. All right. Um, hello, gorgeous purpose and grace. Good to have you back. And uh, Chad Smith. Yeah, you know, uh, just so you know, Chad, we need to make some Chad Smith t-shirts. More of them. We need to. It's just the way it is. We need to make those. More people need Chad Smith in their life. <clears throat> Jesse Peak, how you doing, man? Good to have you back. Oh, they got the guy off the roof yet or what? Uh, let me peek out the window here. Yeah, the sirens aren't flashing anymore. Maybe they did. That wouldn't be Toronto Maple Leaf blue on the walls, would it? We, we, were, we were going for a, sort of like a, a chill Greek vibe in our living room here. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Rock the gas bar. What is up? There he is. Rock the gas bar right there. Yes, man. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. I am so happy you're here, man. I have been looking forward to this one for a while. I really have. Me too. This is good. I think that uh, energy drink I have is really jolting me right now. Yeah. I'm on water. <laughs> That's all right. My waistline is going down. That's all that matters. That's uh, all that matters. I have a six-year-old, so I usually try to go to bed early because uh, she wakes up early. My eight-year-old today, uh, he, um, he's been going through some major growing pains in his knees. And the poor kid, he is just come nighttime around, like right before bed, he is in such pain. So it's quickly a bath with hot bath with Epsom salts and get him to raise his legs and Advil and, and, uh, a hot pad under his knees. And, and I just feel so bad for him right now. So bad for him, but he will not give up hockey. He loves his hockey. And he will not give up his uh, guitar lessons. Someone asked if I have more info on a Lake Ontario UFO. Uh, I I got info on lots of Lake Ontario sightings. (laughs) Is there one in particular you're referring to? No idea. Lake Ontario is a weird place, man. I love it. The beaches are fantastic uh, come summertime. Can't can't go there. I can't go there. (laughs) I, I get I get bloody hives every time I'm in Toronto, man, because all the Maple Leaf fans and Blue Jay fans just drive me nuts. Uh, drive me uh, nuts. Yeah, um, well, we're not really. We're more Raptors fans in this house than anything. I hate the NBA, too. <laughs> what do. don't you hate, Dave? No, no, I'll, I'll tell you why, though. Because the NBA and Michael Heis, Heisler screwed Vancouver. Michael Heisley. Oh, yeah. They screwed Vancouver big time. And when that asshole, Heisley, came out on the court after buying the team to keep it in Vancouver and started singing the Canadian National Anthem, and then two weeks later announced he was moving the fucking team, okay, I figured, you know what, screw you, uh, NBA, and screw you, Michael Heisley, and I've never watched a game from the NBA since. That's 20 years now. 20 years. Oh, wow. Oh, it was pretty exciting here when that, when the Raptors were winning. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, G West. Wait, I see the one, the plane, the Porter plane. Yeah. Um, I've, I found a bit on that. And that's going to be included in a story that's coming out uh, that I'm working on right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, body technician, good morning to you. And B, welcome back to the show. Appreciate you. And, uh, no, 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 no. I will not be careful about my uh, digs on Toronto sports. I will not be careful. You know, 
but it, it, it's easy. It's pretty easy sport to make fun of Toronto teams. Absolutely. Especially when you live <laughs> in the West and all you get is Maple Leaf this, Maple Leaf that. Hi, gorgeous Jessica McCreary. I want to say a big thank you to Double Tim, Ed, Thomas, Snakes, and Cat for the amazing Super Chats tonight. The Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And we really appreciate the support. Thank you to all the veterans tuning on in. You always have a safe home here with Spaced Out Radio in our chat rooms. And to all our regular listeners, you guys make it so much fun. Here we go with the second half hour. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including Rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and our new channel on TikTok. We haven't got any videos yet. That's coming soon. i got to make sure my mug looks okay for that. And it is at Spaced Out Radio. Let's go back to Daniel Otis. He's a contributing journalist for Vice Magazine who's really on top about it when it comes to UFOs in Canada. And recently, Daniel wrote an incredible story about researcher Chris Rutkowski out of Manitoba. And the fascinating, and I would say the detrimental part about this, was that the Canadian military has been handing Chris Rutkowski UFO reports well, some people who have filed freedom of information requests for that same information have been denied. And Daniel, how did you get this story? Uh, it was it was a bit of a long process. So I guess I started looking into this angle uh, probably a good three or so months before the story was published. Uh, how I first started asking questions on this was, um, I, I had been asking uh, Canada's Department of Defense uh, numerous questions about their handling of specific reports. And in one or two instances, they told me, uh, they referred me to, to Chris Rakowski for, uh, you know, for, for more information. Uh, and I asked why, and they said, well, this report was sent to him. Like, they, they told me explicitly. Um, so it, just as background, uh, for those who don't know, Chris Rakowski is a uh, Winnipeg-based uh, ufologist and science writer. He's been on the topic for more than three decades. Uh, he produces and oversees an annual survey of Canadian UFO sightings that has documented some tens of thousands of cases over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, so, you know, they, they told me this, but I, it wasn't really enough you know, for a story. I, I'd asked Chris about it and, you know, he did provide some responses. Uh, but, you know, how the story really broke open for me was uh, in my research into a specific aviation incident. This was a 2018 cargo flight over the Northwest Territories that uh, reported seeing something flying, quote, sporadically and traveling at speeds of between Mach 4 and Mach 5 which is, you know, faster than any known manned aircraft, although, you know, hypersonic weapons can probably hit those kinds of speeds. Anyways, they filed this report, and I, and I obtained Air Force documents on it, and the Air Force documents uh, referenced a procedural checklist called CL213. So as soon as I saw that there was a, a, a UFO-related procedural checklist being mentioned in a, an official Air Force document. Of course, I filed the Freedom of Information request to obtain that. And in that document, I think it's sitting here on my desk somewhere, um, somewhere, in that document, it basically uh, outlines what Air Force procedures are in the case of UFO reports. And the procedural document says if this was from one Canadian Air Division, which is the Royal Canadian Air Force's command hub. And the document basically says if you get a UFO report, 
notify civilian air traffic controllers because obviously they should be aware and then refer the reporter or the reportee to Chris Rakowski. Um, and there it was, you know, so there it was in, in paper that this was actually a formalized procedure. Now, now that document said that sightings were to be referred to him as though if someone called Air Force Command, the Air Force Command Hub with a UFO report, they'd say, here's Chris's contact info, you can get in touch with him. But, you know, through my research, it also came out that Chris was also, uh, for a span of 20 years, receiving reports directly from at least five Canadian military bases from, you know, Western Canada to Eastern Canada across the whole country. And in addition to that, he was receiving reports directly from Transport Canada, which is the Canadian government's uh, transportation department. And so he was, um, you know, for a long period of time, he, he was, you know, for 20 years, he was he was getting these reports directly. Uh, it was initially an informal agreement that was based on a telephone conversation, as he explains it. And he said he received them uh, up until this year and that this year uh, it, it stopped uh, once this whole story, you know, the UAP story became, you know, much more widespread uh, in the media. Uh, you know, that source, he, he says, dried up a bit for him, which is unfortunate. You know, it, it's such a weird situation because I think it's it, it's if Chris hadn't made this arrangement to receive these documents, they could potentially have been hidden from the Canadian public forever. You know, as you mentioned, people have been filing freedom of information requests to obtain this kind of stuff and be coming back and been coming back with absolutely, you know, nothing, nil responses. Um, so it, it's great that Chris has it. But I think, you know, uh, this uh, some people, it, this story rubbed them the wrong way. And I think it, it, perhaps it had to do with the exclusivity of it. You know, I think we've reached a sort of new era and understanding, I, I'd like, I'd hope, on the UFO issue. And, you know, it, it's, it's better that Chris uh, gets this stuff than nobody. But, you know, it would be great if instead of stopping sending this stuff to him, which is a really bad outcome, if that perhaps, you know, if Canada doesn't see this as a national security issue, which they clearly don't based on, you know, the, the information I've been finding, that it would be great if there could at least be some sort of formalized way in which reports of this nature could be given to uh, serious research researchers. Uh, as it stands now, if you want to research this topic, the two main avenues are filing access to information requests or, you know, sending an email to Chris and asking him if he has any uh, records on, on the cases you're looking into. That's something I've been doing, uh, and Chris has been incredibly helpful in opening up his files and records to, you know, provide things like uh, intelligence reports on UFO sightings for cases that I'm investigating. But it's, um, yeah, that that was, <laughs> that's what that story was about. There were a couple of instances in there, and I don't blame Chris Rakowski at all. He happened to be in the right place at the right time. And why not take the information if the government and the military is going to handle it to you? But, but what I don't like about it, and from talking to my own sources in Ottawa, all right, the one thing that I had talked to them about and that they were showing concern about was the fact that even people within Ottawa had put out FOIA requests for information and were getting denied. And some of those reports ended up on Chris Rutkowski's desk. That was a major concern for them. And I know other researchers in Canada who have been denied FOIA requests regarding UFO uh, sightings and UFO reports and information, and they have come to a dead end as well. But they end up on Chris Rutkowski's desk because that's the handshake agreement that was that was made. But I don't understand this this level of two-faced interfacing here where the public who is doing it the proper way by filing the request is being denied, yet the Canadian military is just saying, here, Mr. Rakowski, here you go. And once again, that isn't a shot at Chris. At least the information is getting out there and, and Chris is doing something with it. But you can't give to one when you're not giving to the other. Well, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily see anything, uh, you know, evil or nefarious going on there. The, the inherent problem with the access to information request system in Canada is, is that it's up to individual humans. And, you know, unless you're giving them really, really specific instructions on what you want to find, you're not going to get results. 
you know, I, I, I've had cases where I filed things where that I know something exists and it's come back negative. But I've also, in my experience, found that, you know, if you if, if you get really into the nitty gritty of the procedures and how it works and you can say, I want this type of report number uh, from this specific Air Force squadron from this specific date, uh, you get what you're looking for and often quite quickly. Um, it, it is it is frustrating, I think, for anyone who wants to research this subject that, you know, that they can be denied data when another individual has it and possesses it. Uh, you know, the way it stands now, my, my advice is, um, you know, reach out. I, I, I've reached out and, and Chris has indicated that he's, you know, happy to discuss the matter with uh, serious researchers on, on the topic. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of respect for him and his and his longstanding work. You know, when he when he got into this, you know, 30 years ago, this wasn't the sort of it, the, the topic didn't have the same degree as, of widespread acceptance as it does now, I believe. You know, and he was openly tackling a, ta- a taboo topic in a in a serious academic manner. And, you know, when the government decided that no longer wanted to collect these reports themselves, he was in the right place at, at the right time. And, and it was well deserved. How do we move forward? What happens now? I, I, I frankly don't know. As I mentioned before, Chris says that he's, he's not getting this stuff anymore because of all the widespread media attention, uh, which, which is unfortunate. It means that, you know, those who are researching this topic have to, you know, push that much harder through access to information, freedom of information requests. And the other option is, um, you know, write your members of parliament. Uh, I, I was speaking to somebody in Ottawa who said that uh, MP offices, uh, they don't receive any letters on the subject. You know, in the United States, there's been a lot of uh, real organized, concerted efforts to have letter writing campaigns to members of Congress, to senators. That's not happening in Canada, you know. So if, if you're Canadian and you're listening and you, and you want the government to handle these things differently, uh, you know, write your member of parliament. As, as it stands now, the, uh, the Canadian government and military, they, they document reports, uh, they collect reports, but they don't act on them. You know, once it's determined that a sighting isn't something like a conventional threat, like a, you know, a foreign fighter jet, uh, official interest in Canada appears to end. Doesn't mean that reports aren't sent off uh, to other places like NORAD and Colorado, uh, but in terms of what's happening within our borders, there seems to be a little interest. So my argument is, you know, let's not push our military to make this a defense issue. You know, once if this were to become a defense issue in Canada, as it is in the United States, all data can best be withheld from freedom of information requests on national security grounds. Uh, the Black Vault today uh, just published something saying that their uh, requests for documentation on, uh, you know, official military UAP reports were all declined on national security grounds. We don't want that happening in Canada. Right now, you can file requests, and if you're specific, you know, sometimes, you know, you can get stuff. My, my batting average, you know, I'm pretty 50-50 on when I get returns. But that's that's something, you know. I, I think if people are writing members of parliament, and I, I really urge people perhaps to do things like that, um, just there needs just say there needs to be more transparency that, you know, this sort of data should be made available for those who want to investigate it. Plain and simple. If it's not a national security issue, then of course Chris should have access to this. Absolutely, and of course should all other all other researchers who want to look into this in a in a serious way. Let's stick with Ottawa for a second here because this plays a very very big role. Now I have been privy to sources telling me that when former ambassador to the United States David McNaughton was read into this project. And then that meeting went or had uh, McNaughton flown to Ottawa where he debriefed Prime Minister Trudeau and Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan on the UAP phenomena and, and what was going on. Now, I'm not going to give my sources out to, to who told me that, but they're pretty reputable in knowing what is going on. Why have we not heard the uh, the prime minister or the defense minister speak out about this topic? I mean, why why would they? I, they're, they're elected officials. And I think from their perspective, 
there's no political capital in, in speaking about this issue. In Canada, if you are an elected official speaking openly about, you know, the UFOs, you're either per you're perceived probably as being a little bit wacky. And if people are taking you seriously, then the implications of you speaking out about it are that you want to dedicate taxpayer funds in to, you know, UFO research when, you know, there's how many communities in this country that don't have, you know, fresh drinking water? You know what I mean? It's such a delicate balance. I think perhaps in Canada, more work needs to be done behind the scenes um, to encourage uh, transparency with the data. And I think the other thing that we encounter in Canada compared to the United States is um, party discipline in Ottawa is incredibly strict. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., you'll have people within the Democrat and Republican Party disagreeing with each other publicly, voting with or against each other. They don't always follow party lines. In, in Canada, it's it's not like that at all. You know, when you have votes in Parliament, it's always on party lines. Uh, individual uh, parliamentarians seldom uh, raise their voice. And if they do, it's definitely not going to be something controversial that, uh, you know, that hasn't been authorized by up high. We, we just have a very uh, conservative political environment that doesn't encourage independent voices like there are in the United States. And it's, you know, that's probably a problem with our democracy. And it's frankly exciting to see in the United States that you have people, Democrats, Republicans, people on all sides of the aisle taking this up as a bipartisan issue that's worth serious, you know, further looking. And that's true. There's not a lot of free votes within the parliamentary system in Ottawa. But, have you know, I have talked to my sources in Ottawa here, and I know that this topic behind the scenes, outside of the cameras uh, and outside of, of open doors, they are talking about this subject. Why haven't we seen any of the opposition parties really tackle this story, even though we know that this story is being talked about behind closed doors? You know, I, I have, I've heard much the same as you, that this is a topic that is being discussed behind closed doors in both the two major political parties in Canada. Um, why is no one making a public stand? I think it, it really goes back to what I was saying earlier about just nobody wanting to jump outside of party lines. I think the only way you could see a politician in Canada coming out publicly is if, one, they received authorization from their leader, or two, they were a total maverick who just, you know, didn't care what the leader thought about them. You know, and outside of that, I, I, I'm not sure you're going to see uh, anyone stand up. But, you know, hopefully that'll change. I, I think, you know, shows like yours, continued coverage like mine, all the other good work that's being done out there on the subject is helping. And the fact that at the very least, you know, American data is making its way into mainstream Canadian news, at least that's helpful in raising awareness and, you know, getting people in Ottawa to be interested. But, uh, you know, it would be nice if we could have our, uh, our Bill Nelson or our Marco Rubio who would, you know, take a stand in Canada and, you know, publicly declare, hey, let's be serious about this. Um, it, it would be very welcome. But, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't see that happening super, anytime incredibly soon, but um, I, I, it's something I'm working on uh, hopefully making happen as well. Yeah, me too. And, and, you know, the funny part about it is I think it's kind of ignorant that the opposition parties haven't brought it up. I even brought that up to my sources, especially after in the House of Lords over in the United Kingdom, there was a two-hour debate about UAPs after the American DNI report came out. And I said to my sources in Ottawa, I said, you had a perfect opportunity in question period to sneak in a question or two about this topic, and you guys chickened out. You chickened out. Britain had just done it, the Americans had just done it, and you chickened out. I said, you dropped the ball, as per usual. And I said, I don't, I, I said, and, and my source agreed with me. 
My source agreed with me that they probably couldn't have done it. But once again, it goes right back to what you were saying, Daniel, that if the big man on campus, which is the party leader, doesn't give the thumbs up to it, it doesn't happen. And if you look at all three parties, they all have people with military backgrounds in very high up positions. Yeah, they, they, they do. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I don't I don't have a strong opinion on whether or not that was a missed opportunity. I mean, from their perspective as well, this was an election year in Canada. Um, and, I, and I'm sure the, you know, the opposition party in the lead up to an election, of course, didn't want the headlines to be dominated by their newfound interest in, uh, you know, flying objects in the sky. Um, perhaps now, you know, perhaps maybe there's opportunities now, you know, we, we have every indication to believe we're not going to have another election in Canada for hopefully another two years, at least, you know, with another minority government. So, uh the times now work those sources make them talk dave <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying and i know you were trying but do you get frustrated by that no, I, I... knowing that you have this information you know those conversations are happening because i know i'm frustrated by it because well, you, you don't have to that... add to... go ahead just to add to your frustration you know i filed you mentioned uh alleged meetings with uh, Canada's former ambassador to the United States. I filed several access to information requests uh, on that subject, all of which have come back with no records found. So, you know, I, I was very specific about certain terms to be used in certain emails between certain people on certain dates. Uh, nothing. I'm trying. Maybe, I given up. maybe we just got to keep tweeting. <laughs> maybe that's the way to do it. We need UFO Twitter Canada. There'll be about 14 of us. That's it. But that's okay. You know, you know what I, for me, frankly, I, I, I think the thing to do is to just, you know, keep working, keep doing what we're doing. You know, uh, in, in my case, that's trying to find new data, um, trying to find procedures, trying to find the nuts and bolts documents from our, our military and our governments that show that there is a paper trail that, Credible people do see these things. I, I frankly, I'm not, I'm not too disturbed by the lack of, um, you know, politicians speaking openly about this in Canada. I, while I'd like it to happen, I, I, I don't think it's necessary. I, 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 because I'm also, you know, I'm also afraid that the dominant narrative in this subject is, is the so-called threat narrative that, you know, this phenomenon should be treated as a potential threat. In the Canadian Air Force has clearly decided that that's not the case for them, or at least in most cases. Um, if they change their mind and treat all instances of uh, UAP as potential threats, then suddenly people who actually want to research the subject in Canada are, are going to have the, the access to information door closed in their face. So, you know, getting more political involvement and getting more involvement in Ottawa is potentially a double-edged sword for research. You know, if, if our military starts behaving like the Pentagon, suddenly citizens and civilians who are interested in the topic are going to be completely shut out from being able to obtain any official data. So it, it's like it, we, we have to tread lightly. Yes, I want politicians in Canada to speak out. And, and also I'm like, oh, if they do, there's some pretty bad implications for, for those who really want to dig into this topic. We got about 45 seconds to go, and we may have to carry this one over to the next break. But at any point, have you or your sources been told that the reason why Canada has been so silent is a directive from the United States and their role with NORAD? I've never heard anything to that effect. Are, no. you, are you surprised? Have you? No, <laughs> no, I, I, I wish I had, because that's a big question that I do have is what is the pull on NORAD? And well, and that's a big one for us. Well, there's you know every indication that Canada sends uh, reports to NORAD in Colorado. You know, I've found emails about, um, you know, alleged UFO sightings where, you know, people at uh, Peterson uh, Space Force Base, uh, then it was Air Force Base in the email, were which is a, you know, a NORAD affiliated facility in part of in Colorado, they were being sent reports 
from Canada. So wow. there, I, I think there's definitely threads to pull in terms of what's happening in Colorado with NORAD. Uh, for those who don't know, NORAD is the Joint well, Canada-U.S. Air Defense Pact. Let's and hold they- on right there. We only have Daniel Otis for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Great interview so far. UFOs in Canada. What's happening? What's the big news? Where's it going? We'll find out more with Daniel right after the break in hour two. Flying by here, buddy. Flying by. Yeah, good times. Mm-hmm. So far, so good for you, Dave? Perfect. The only disappointment is I only got you for 90. We'll do it again. I like the idea of your Thursday, your Thursday thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, you'll get me even uh, sharper if you talk to me in the afternoon. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Hey, want to hear something crazy? Love to. Did you see the story I did on the um, d- the Department of Defense flight that was on its way to pick up people in Afghanistan that saw some sort of green glowing object? No, I missed that. Fill me so in. So that was that was in July of uh, this year. A Canadian defense plane on its way to Afghanistan, and a uh, and a Dutch KLM flight flying parallel from uh, Boston to Amsterdam both saw a glowing green object. So this report was made public in Transport Canada's Aviation Incident Database, and they took it down. It was it was, it was up for like a month, and then they took it down. They man, I, I I asked them, hey, what's going on here? They say they're editing it. I had something weird happen today. What's that? So I was at my daytime job. I was like, this honestly tripped me out a little bit. I was walking from my office, getting ready to finish the day, and I had my son there with me. And so I was taking his empty iced tea bottle to our recycling bin. And I have to pass the bathrooms. And the first bathroom that I have to pass is the men's bathroom. I saw the men's door open up. And I'm only about six feet away from this. I saw the men's bathroom door open up. The light turn off, door open, wide open, and nobody came out. Weird. Yeah. And I just stood there and I'm like, did I just see what I just saw? Right? And I stood there and I'm like, what the hell is this going on, man? And uh, it's only a one stall bathroom. Like there's only one toilet in there and one sink. You know, I mean, it's not like one of these... You know, bigger bathrooms where there's, you know, multiple stalls or anything like that. Wait, so so ghosts got to go too? I guess so. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get that. Yeah. yeah. Spectral urination. I don't know what the hell it was, but apparently ghost poop is a thing now. Uh, your... so, someone in the chat asked if I was a spy. No, I am not a spy. You're not a spy? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th- I, I guess is that flattering if somebody thinks you're a spy? Oh, I had no. that a long time ago. That was fun. No. Um, I would like a spy salary. So would I. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I told my sources point blank, I can be bought. I said if there <laughs> if there's a UFO job somewhere within CSIS or the Canadian government, I can be bought to end this show very easily to go work on the woo. I can. <laughs> Kaiju and Zero Cool. How you doing, guys? VPXM, good to see you, buddy. Been a while. Nice to have you back. And uh, what's Belenium saying? What if the reason Trudeau traveled to Tofino and missed the first day of national reconciliation was to meet secretly about the UFO topic? No, he's too stupid. He's too stupid. Surfing, you have to realize, he is the most important thing about Canada. That's all I'm going to say. He is the most important thing. When he looks at Canada, he says, how good am I for this country? And Toronto boy here is not going to say anything because his entire city voted for him. And I live in the boonies, so we went a different way. But that's okay. You know, Justin Trudeau does not have a Chad Smith t-shirt. That's the biggest reason issue that he has right now. He needs a Chad Smith (laughs) t-shirt. 
You, you can send him one, eh? You got the address. Oh, yeah. He's in public housing. <laughs> Technically, he is in public housing. <laughs> oh, my God. I was talking to one of my Toronto buddies. I was giving him a shot. I'm like, I'm like, you vote for him. You voted for him. And he's like, dude, I didn't vote for anybody. What were the what were the choices? Slim, none, or zero? Yeah, I've uh, I, I've you know politically uh, in elections, I've, I've dabbled a little all over the place. Is it, for me, it's usually who is the candidate in my riding? Who is the person I respect the most? Who is the person that's going to get stuff done? Who is the person with the most integrity? And I, I've found that's been different people from different parties as the years have gone by. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we need a Chad Smith t-shirt of him jumping the shark, much like Fonzie. That's what we need. Chad Smith versus the shark. We got about one minute, Dan. Oh, good. I'm scrolling through the comments. Anything else? What yeah. do I think it all is? I think it's probably a thousand different things. Yeah. Most ordinary Maybe some not. Hi, Noble Patrick. Good to see you. All right. I want to say a big thank you to Rex, Todd, Cat Chaser, Snakes, Thomas, Ed, and Tim for the amazing super chats. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you very much for the love and support. Thank you to all the veterans tune in. Don't forget to do some shopping on our store on our website. And here we go with the second hour. You're listening to spaced out radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at spaced out radio and on Facebook spaced out radio show. Second hour of Space Down Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Thank you to everyone tuning us in on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Dapocagnus. I got that so wrong. Dapocagnus. Dapocagnus? Whatever it is, the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on our new channel on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio, at Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time, we introduce Daniel Otis. He is a contributing journalist of Vice Magazine and Vice Online. Great journalist who's really been hammering home the Canadian side of ufology. And Daniel, we welcome you back right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right. We got to make a go here. We got to get a lot of information in in the next twenty minutes here before we got to say good night to you. But but I want to I want you to tell us in regards to the sightings that people are seeing in Canada, what is being reported. Uh, you have mentioned you know a few sightings that the military has had along with civilians. Is this happening often? Um. Yeah. In a sense. So most of my research, you know, if, if you include civilian sightings, you know, based on the work that uh, ufologist Chris Rakowski does, you know, there's, there's sightings happening all the time. My, my research uh, initially began by looking into aviation sightings. So, you know, sightings by pilots on major airlines. And I, by going back uh, about 20 years, I was able to find close to 200 uh, anomalous reports in the Canadian government's um, aviation incident 
database. Now, this database is called CADORS. That's it's the acronym C A D O R S, and it's you know it contains uh, things uh, you know bird strikes, mechanical failures. Uh, engine issues, you name it. If there's an incident, it's logged in the system. So by combing through thousands of reports, I was able to find, you know, approximately 200 that had been labeled as being, you know, UFO cases. And of that number, there was about, you know, a dozen or so that were highly anomalous. So if you're looking at that sort of math, it means, you know, well, like it, Every can you do math on the fly? But it basically means that you know there's a pilot reporting something weird every month or two in Canada, going back the past 20 years. And these are reports from major airlines as well as you know small private aircraft. And the major airlines have included uh, Air Canada, uh, WestJet, uh, Porter Airlines, Delta, Qatar Airways. Um, there's been cargo flights. There's been Canadian military planes. Just uh, in late July of this year, a uh, Canadian Department of Defense flight on its way to pick up at-risk personnel from Afghanistan, as well as a Dutch KLM flight from uh, Boston to Amsterdam. We're flying parallel uh, near the island of Newfoundland in the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, and they both ob uh, observed a glowing green object. And reported it, you know, so just that that was in July of this year involving, you know, defense aircraft. So these reports are happening in Canadian airspace. Uh, even more frequently, citizens are logging reports and also, you know, peppered through the records. There's also reports uh, from police officers. Uh, just this uh, recently, I did a story about a uh, 2011 report from a Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer in uh about near Winnipeg, Manitoba, who saw an unusual light, uh, recorded it with his dash cam, and then like submitted that to, as evidence to Canadian transportation officials. Uh, in my research, I found the parts that weren't mentioned in the story was that there is another case uh, involving uh, RCMP officers in the exact same town in both 2017 and in 1967. And the one from 1967 was weirder. You know, so the, these reports are happening and going back into Canadian archives, I found reports from the dawn of the Cold War era. And I'm talking about reports from Air Force personnel and, you know, military personnel going right up until this year. That's incredible. RCMP have ha played a big role. And one of the things that tipped me off was talking to an RCMP officer and later having it confirmed by a dispatcher that, even though they don't talk UFOs, the minute a UFO report comes onto a st staff sergeant's desk after being called in, they have to immediately deal with it, which means that information gets sent to Ottawa, which immediately gets sent to NORAD in the United States, where the two closest CF-18 Hornets are, are uh, triangulated to that area to try and intercept the craft. Have you heard anything about this? Um, you know, the RCMP angle isn't one that I have focused on wholeheartedly. I focus on like reports filed by RCMP officers, but in terms of reports filed to the RCMP, uh, that's something I haven't looked into as much, mostly because just in my, you know, trying to push these stories into, you know, mainstream media through an outlet like Vice, it's, you know, my, I'm still on the uphill battle of trying to get people to accept the, you know, the fundamental veracity uh, uh, and authenticity of these reports. So, so, you know, talking about citizen reports to the RCMP isn't something I've delved into, but there's so much unexplored potential there. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, you know, throughout most of Canada and particularly in remote communities, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which we often call the Mounties, it's a federal police force. And they're pretty much the only police force in large swaths of remote parts of Canada. Right. So it stands to reason that if somebody sees something weird and they live in a remote community, the first person, the first people they're probably going to report it to is, is the RCMP. So, you know, there, there's so much potential there for, for digging into the subject. How do we start to get these people to talk? Because Canada always has had this, this rule that if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter whether it's our parents. It doesn't matter whether it's our teachers, our, our police officers, our government officials. If we don't talk about it, the topic does not matter and does not exist. How do we break that old cycle? 
Well, I, I think it's beginning to break. Uh, I think it's it's thawing. I've you know some of my stories have included uh, on the record uh, interviews. You know, uh, a story I wrote on uh, documenting Canadian military's history of filing reports included on the record testimony from a. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, he achieved the rank of a lieutenant colonel uh, during his career. So, you know, people are coming out of the woodwork slowly but surely. But, you know, it, it's still <laughs> there, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think, you know, I have to, as a journalist, prove to people, one, I'm going to respect their identities if they, you know, choose to change their mind or choose to be anonymous uh, Two, And you have to, like, demonstrate a track record of, of handling the subject in a way that's, you know, that's respectful and, and sensitive to those who've had these kinds of experiences. Um, I'm working on material that does involve some on the record interviews, uh, you know, with people, um, you know, I've already done on the military. I've, I've, I've spoken to a, uh, an RCMP officer who, who had a, a sighting um, for actually the sighting that I, the, the, I mentioned that I published a story about a um, an RCMP officer who saw something in 2011. After the story was published, I spoke to him, you know, on the record. And, you know, something based on that, uh, you can expect me to do something with that very, very soon. And and he he's willing to talk about it, you know. And I think we just have to keep pushing. Um, it will change, you know. I think once there's a sort of more... Uh, widespread paradigm shift whereby most people accept that this is, you know, a real topic, then I think you're, you're going to start to see more people coming out of the woodwork and it's happening right now. You know, look at, look at the U S Navy pilots who, who've come out and gone on the record some years after their experiences. Sometimes I, I think, I think the stage is currently being set. I'm optimistic. More people are going to be coming forward very soon. Well, it- that was leads to my next question. Does Canada need its own David Fravor? The American fighter pilot who was the first one to intercept a Tic Tac. Do we need that Canadian CF-18 pilot, whether it's from 409 Squadron or 410 or 425 out of Quebec, do we need one of them to come out and say, this is what I saw? Because that could open up the entire Pandora's box. Yeah, and I, well, I think you know somebody like that would really help legitimize the topic, uh, you know, for people in Ottawa, uh, especially if you, if you were hypothetically to have a Canadian military aviator who said, you know, I was out maneuvered by something unusual, you know, th- th- that would be, you know, a phenomenal story. There's, you know, I've the historical record from the Cold War era, you know, shows cases of that nature. Um, you know, I've, I've heard rumors of that effect from, you know, more modern periods involving the Canadian Air Force, but it, there's nothing I personally have been able to substantiate. You know, uh, if, if I ever found even the smallest scrap of evidence uh, that something of that nature occurred, you can trust that I, I would run with it <laughs> and do a story. Um, but it's, you know, does that Canadian even exist? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've, I've heard in the rumor mill that they do. And, and if they do exist, you know, you, you've got my email address or, or give Dave a call. But we, <laughs> Canada would love to hear from you. couple questions from our audience because I, I want to put it out there too. If any uh, fighter pilot in Canada currently or previous over the last 30, 40 years has intercepted a, a UFO, give us a ring. Get a hold of us because your story needs to be told and we can't say enough about that. But a couple questions from our audience. One was asking, you know, do we have a lot of UFO crash sites here? Have you heard of any? Yes, in in the historical record. But again, nothing, nothing, nothing completely conclusive in my eyes you know i i saw that within the canadian um i previously mentioned that there's this big uh government historical archive run by a uh, library and archives canada of uh, old ufo reports and, and those did include some rcmp investigations of space debris but it was, it was inconclusive you know all evidence appeared that it was pretty conventional the sort of things you expect to fall out of the sky is do we have, is there a Canadian Roswell? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But if there is, you know, I'd like to hear about it too. 
does Canada have its own Area 51? Um, again, you know, the thing, the big difference, uh, one of the big differences with Canada and the United States is, you know, our, our military doesn't invest as heavily into developing future technologies. You know, we're a country that, you know, with some exceptions, with some very notable exceptions, but by and by large advanced military equipment is, um, per, you know, purchased from other countries like the United States. So do we have an Area 51 that has, you know, perhaps experimental aircraft or exotic materials? Not, not that I know of. I've heard people refer to CFB Cold Lake, which is a, a base in uh, northern Alberta. That's our big oil producing province here. Um, I, I've heard people refer to that as our Area 51, and there is a record of you know sev- you know a couple anomalous sightings from that region, but you know not th- we, we don't have this sort of legendary uh, sites in Canada outside, I guess, of Falcon Lake, Manitoba, which uh, and and Shag Harbor, uh, Nova Scotia, which I th- both were famous cases. I think they were both in from 1967. Is that right, Dave? Yes. Well, there was the one a few years ago that happened in winter, just north of, of Lake Winnipeg, where there was an alleged UFO crash into the lake, and the military went, and this was on a reserve, and the military went racing over there, and all reports, the early reports was it was a UFO, something weird happened, and then all of a sudden, nothing. The military well, stated that they were doing a training exercise. The people who were claiming that it was a UFO said, oh, it wasn't, we we made a mistake. I mean, I believe this was five, six years ago. Well, and on a similar note, I have actually a document obtained through access to information request. Uh, this is a 2018 email. This is from the uh, the Royal the Canadian Air Force's uh, Rescue Operations Center in Halifax, and it's an email that says that they were uh, a concerned citizen saw something fall in the water and could neither confirm nor deny having a person on board. And then a rescue, a search and rescue helicopter. Uh, t- was sent out to do a search of the area. They conducted a search of the area with nothing seen. And the uh, the subject of the email uh, has the words UFO sighting in it. So a citizen saw basically a UFO uh, go into the ocean near Prince Edward Island, uh, you know, called 911, who notified uh, search and rescue, the Air Force's search and rescue teams, which went to go check out what was happening out, out there and then saw nothing. So they, they do respond to things like this. That is interesting. Do you think we, we are keeping, the, is, let me rephrase it, the Canadian military is keeping the secrets of this because of the close ties and partnership with the United States? Perhaps. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to editorialize on that. I, you know, in my, my dealings, I actually find I've been dealing a lot with the public affairs office for the Air Force in Canada, and I actually find them to be relatively transparent. You know, if I ask them a direct question, I get a direct response from them. Um, I, the same can't necessarily be said for other parts of uh, the Canadian government. But, you know, they, their statement is uh, Canada, the Canadian military does not concern itself with UFO reports unless they represent a real or credible threat or a uh, search and rescue. And so this was a case where somebody's, you know, what I just mentioned, somebody saw something go into the ocean. So it was potential search and rescue. So they went out, saw nothing, and it was case closed. Um, you know, and there are cases where Canadian military personnel see things that are genuinely weird. Uh, but, you know, the Air Force says, yes, we believe they saw what they saw. You know, we logged the report, we filed it away, we notified the relevant people. But as far as we're concerned, this is outside of our mandate. Our mandate is to deal with, you know, credible threats, uh, you know, like other countries and, you know, glowing objects in the sky. As far as uh, the Canadian perspective is, is that's not considered a credible threat. And the official records, you know, everything... Everything I've been able to uncover through, you know, the freedom of information requests, the interviews, the interviews I've done behind the scenes that I can never publish, everything indicates that there is there is no suppressed UFO program in Canada. And that if any real work is being done on some of the more interesting Canadian sightings, it's probably being done in the United States 
probably most likely by NORAD in Colorado, if it's being done. Uh, there's, I have no indication to see that Canada has been really digging deep in a way like the UAP task force is doing in the United States. That surprises me. And, and you buy that considering that, you know, North American airspace is pretty much predominantly patrolled by U.S. aircraft? I do. I think that there's so are you asking me if I think that there's pressure being exerted by the United States to maintain Canadian silence? But, but how do that doesn't necessarily really make sense to me, because why would they be pressuring us to be silent on an issue that they're increasingly being outspoken and public about? Well, no, I mean, they're being outspoken, but, but along a great narrative as well. Well, yes, they are maintaining a, a specific narrative. I, I, I don't know, Dave. I, I, I honestly, I, I don't have a firm answer for that question. I can tell you my research does not indicate that that's happened. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Um, my, my research shows that, though, that there is information sharing, that Canada does send reports off to the United States. You know, the Air Force and my, you know, dealings with the Public Affairs Office, they, they say that, you know, intelligence reports that contain, you know, alleged UFO sightings are shared. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer for your question other than, you know, what my research indicates to me. It just and what it indicates to me is that, you know, at some point during the Cold War, you know, the reports kept coming in. Canada and the United States created a reporting system to track these kinds of reports. Uh, and that at some point during the Cold War, uh, you know, Canadian military officials decided this isn't the Russians. So we're not so worried. Well, I mean, we don't know if there's a worry or not just yet, my friend. We do not know. That is the big one that we that we do not know. We only have you for about three more minutes here. What is the big stories coming up regarding this topic and Canada and the Canadian government and the military? Um, well, in terms of what you can expect from me, uh, you know, I've I, I think what was it? Today it was uh, today I filed my uh, my hundredth access to information request of the year. Um, about forty of them or so have been processed so far. More data is coming in, um, and I'm working on pieces that are going to provide a lot more detail and granularity uh, about exactly how reports are handled. You know, there's I've uncovered proof, for example, that the Canadian Air Force is uh, checking radar data when air traffic controllers are telling them that, you know, uh, pilots on major airlines see something. So there, there, there's going to be some more granularity. There's more cases and hopefully some, uh, you know, exclusive interviews, uh, witness testimonies. Um, really just I, I plan to keep on with what I'm doing, you know, using uh, declassified records to show that, yes, uh, you know, sightings of this nature happen. Yes, they're being filed by, you know, credible people. And yes, the Canadian government and Air Force actually have reporting mechanisms whereby these reports are collected. Even though they're not investigated, at least they're being collected. So there are reporting mechanisms. There are reports. There is data. You know, let's let's work for more transparency for that. No, I, I think that's great. As we've got about 90 seconds to go here, my friend, I want to say a big thank you for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. It really does mean a lot to have you on here. I mean, we've talked on the phone numerous times here. We've we've shared some very private stories and, and information as well. And I'm very thankful that you're, you're a high-quality journalist and someone who I believe, and I want our audience to know, that I trust in getting the proper story out there regarding this topic. I think you're doing it right. There's very few that are, Daniel, that are calling it down the middle and just presenting the facts. Good job on, on doing true journalism on this subject. You need to be commended. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate the kind words. It shows the work's not in vain. You know, if you just stick to what's in the official records, you know, like, it, it's just, it's compelling. It, it, it's, it's, it's so compelling. And, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing. And, and that's what I'll continue to do. And thank you. You know, your, your show's great. And I'm really glad we finally made this happen. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Quickly, where can people find your work? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter uh, at DS Otis. 
Um, I have a personal website, uh, www.danielotis.ca. Uh, there's links there to all of my UAP reporting, as well as uh, links to stories I've did before. You know, I've been working as a journalist uh, for about a decade. So the, actually, the, you know, the UAP stuff, uh, uh, which has really gripped me, it's, it's, it's a small drop in, in, in my output. So if you're curious, you can find me there. And, uh, and also you know, Twitter, especially, I, I'm often posting documents and tidbits of information that don't make it into my stories. So it's, it's a good place if you want to get a little more detail on some of the things I'm reporting on. All right, Daniel Otis, everybody. Coming up next, we're going to be joined by the fedora-wearing John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report and from the Experiencer Support Association, Ryan Stacy will join us as well as we continue the UFO talk on Space Out Radio next. Stay tuned. Great job, buddy. Great job. Thanks, man. No problem. No problem. Yeah? I appreciate that, brother. That was Sorry, phenomenal. I always got to remember, I got to explain Canadian things because we're not always <laughs> kilometers, places. What's the RCMP? Uh, oh, no I, worries, buddy. Tr- <laughs> That's they, one thing I'm always forgetting. These, but Ameri- I, these Americans tuned in. I, I've kind of warmed them up for you. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Let's uh, let's do it again sometime. We will. Prom- promise you. Take care. All right. I'm going to bed. Take care. Good night. Good night. All right. There is John Hudson. John, we're going to bring in Ryan Stacy here from the Experiencer Support Association as well. And uh, and I think we'll have a good uh, debate over the next hour, you know, just about Ryan's shaving habits, which are terrible. And I'd just like to say real quick, like, that guy was cool. That was a very mm-hmm. interesting perspective. A really, really interesting perspective. I like that. A true down the middle journalistic uh, perspective, which is which if we could get more Daniel Otis's covering this story, we'd be better off and probably further ahead. What's funny is that it's still so rare. It won't be someday. It won't be, but today it's still so rare that when you see like this, do go, this guy do it right. It looks weird. You're like, wait, I don't see that very often. Oh, that's the right way to do it. You know, it's, 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 um, yeah, that was cool. Very nice. Very interesting perspective. Very nice. Excellent. I don't understand. Uh, no. No. We're good. All right. Close that out. Go like this. Come on, Ryan. Hurry up. We're waiting for you. Maybe if we all focus. We're all waiting for you, Ryan. (laughs) There he is. Turn some lights on. Lighting it. You're not the shadow man from Deal or No Deal. Is this some kind of competition? Turn some lights. I can go darker. I'm trying. Hold on here. Holy cow, there he is, people. Look at that. My grandmother has more chin hair than you. Just give me a second. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep, we can. Okay, yeah, just give me a second. Hold on. You need some headphones. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to run upstairs then. I wasn't expecting to do this live on the spot. So let me run upstairs and I'll be right back. All right, hurry up. Okay. It, I find it interesting there's groups of, of people doing YouTube that some of them primarily only do canned shows and some of them primarily only do live shows. And, and when it mixes, some people get like, you know, like it's, it's, oh, it's, I, it's I just, just a funny different way of doing it. Right? I saw Ryan hop into our chat room, so I messaged him like a couple ah, minutes before the break. Ah, okay. I'm like, hey, do you want to hop on with John and I? Hey, B. Hoff, how you doing, buddy? What's happening? I got gotcha. you. I recorded a, a one minute video for Bumblefoot tonight to see how uh, 
good my son is improving at his guitar lessons. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. You can get a hoodie like this by going to ufogarage.com and check out Ben and Joe's high quality selection of clothing. Nicola, you're absolutely right. Daniel Otis is a great journalist to have on our side. Great journalist. Hey, B. Hoff, you never have to feel feel blue and down, man. We always got your back here, brother. Always got your back. Even though you use a reverse headstock on your guitars, we're okay with that. Uh, River Dogma Pitbull, what's happening? Good to have you here, man. And yeah, don't forget, you get your Merle shirts and your Chad Smith shirts at spacedoutradio.com. All right. Hey, Dave, I have like a, I have like a really fundamental question while we're waiting here. Oh, there you uh, go. Uh, hold on here. We only got about 18 yeah, no seconds worries. here. Uh, so uh, thank you to Rex, Todd, Tim, Ed, Thomas, Snakes, and Cat for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. And stay tuned, guys. We're going to go here in three seconds. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. We really do appreciate it. Want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bubblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, follow us on uh, and check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and on our TikTok channel as we're just starting to grow that at Spaced Out Radio as well. We are now joined by John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report and from tessacan.org, which is the Experiencer Support Association here in Canada, Ryan Stacy, you'll notice on YouTube and Twitch that Ryan hasn't shaved in about six years, which is very nice. He's been growing his mustache the last four and a half. You can barely see it, but we still love the guy around here. And uh, thank you guys for joining us to continue this UFO talk. And Ryan, I want to start with you on this one because <laughs> you are somebody who has had FOIA requests denied by the Canadian government or the Canadian military or wherever you selected them and and sent them to, what was it like for you to, you know, find out that the Canadian military was just handing over reports freely to Chris Rakowski? Well, first of all, um, I don't believe I've been denied. Uh, They come back saying no record found. So in order for me to determine whether or not the ones I'm asking for are the same ones that Rutowski has would require me access to his archives. Um, so I, w- I can't really confirm that as far as wh- how did I react when I found out? I knew all along. I knew since two th- uh, since since I started with MUFON. I've been chasing Rutowski on this on the back end privately for a very, very long time. And part of my uh, outing and all this other stuff with MUFON was because, you know, they were protecting him and protecting all this, all this stuff. So I gave all my information to Otis, <clears throat> excuse me, and threw into comment on his journalism as he validated it. He fact checked it. He looked into it, continued the story through. And then, you know, and then, and then he released it a few years later. So for me, this was validation because I've been chasing that rabbit for a long time. Why do you think this subject is still so closed in in Canadian Parliament and the Canadian government and the media? I don't see. I, I, I look at it differently. 
for me as a private investigator, okay, by trade, I'm looking at the evidence like we've already, they've already released the information. From my observation of what's been done in Canada, using Rutowski as an example, whether you like him or not, he's withheld information. He hasn't used the information to the best ability in which it could have been used. So what I'm doing on our website with Tessa Can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is I'm actually taking these documents, whether they come from Otis or they come for, from us, from whatever ones come up or from the internet, anyone else that puts it on. Uh, Grant Cameron sometimes release some stuff, but I got to get back to the original source, get those original documents. I'm splitting it up into a timeline. I'm splitting it up to a visual evidence database so you can see proximity where these things are happening. Uh, I'm also pointing out points of interest. So on our website, you can see everyone that's mentioned, every location that's mentioned. So I'm splitting it up because I'm actually, I'm actually investigating it in terms of looking to see the patterns. Um, so yeah, like, so the pattern for me is, yeah, we request, we ask for it, we get a response. If they were hiding some stuff, then there would be no response at all. No one has been asking. They've been giving it to Chris. And, and Chris has been doing whatever he has been doing with it. Now, if he's been releasing it privately, then good for him. That works for his little circuit. But it's never, it's never been mentioned any time he's been in the media. It's never been mentioned uh, like all the other reporting agencies, such as MUFON and Tessa and everyone else that's put information in the surveys have never been mentioned in mainstream media. He's a media guy. You know, so 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 the problem I don't think is the government. I think the government has been transparent. They gave the information. We don't have time for this. You're obviously interested in it. Do something with it. And then it was just a cash cow for him all these years. And then for me, what frustrates me is I'm playing catch up. You know, when when you know, starting back from the beginning, and Otis is is doing a tremendous amount of help because he's getting information that correlates with the stuff that I'm tracking, and I can I can let some of these paths go. I let him lead that perfect when it comes in, take it and get you know, and and add it to the database. So to me, Rutowski has always been um, nothing, a zero, a waste of a waste in ufology, as far as I'm concerned based from an evidence point of view, because I'm frustrated that all that information was available and not used properly. And that's because I'm a private investigator and I look at evidence every single day I prep for court. Like we had so much time if this was done properly. That's, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Wow. Okay. So we can uh, officially put, uh, uh, or take Chris Rakowski off your Christmas card list. I, I... <laughs> well, hey, as an individual, you know, like he's a night, you know, like uh, not not like you say too, like like uh, as the person. I mean, it's the intent, the integrity, all the things that he tried to do. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he tried the best that he could with what he knew and what he understood in a time period back in the day. He was also the only person that had the information, so he was on top of the freaking mountain. And he's been on the mountain for so long. And if anything, with that article, what Otis had done is he, he just leveled the playing field because now Rutowski is sharing information. Rutowski is giving that information to Otis. Otis is bringing those stories out. That is what we need for disclosure. He's still not talking to me. He will not. He will not even, even though if I'm complimenting him, trying to like, hey, good job. Thanks for doing these things. Finally, after all these years, you know, you know, I'm not going to he's not going to invite me to his parties either. But. That's not the point. The point is, is the information's now got out. It started with, started with me. I gave the information to Otis and then Otis broke the story. Now we're having a conversation and that, that should be a, a team effort. Rotowski is still part of that. You yeah, know, he just, yeah. it's just logistically, he, he didn't handle it the way that, uh, in my opinion, and in many others' opinions uh, of the way to do it. And we don't know, the handshake agreement. We don't know uh, if that's even the truth. We still don't know if he, if because he's a media guy, that maybe he was supposed to cover it up. Who knows? We don't know that. But now, the story's out. The, we don't have to be mad. We know the jig is up, and then and we just get the information out, and then everybody can do something with it. Because I've also confirmed, and I'll say this for the first time too, since and I wasn't expecting to be on here. I was just listening, uh, and. Um, 
but I have gotten confirmation that the, you know, the Canadian Space Agency, who used to refer UFO reports to TESSA, uh, is no longer referring UFO reports to TESSA because of the Rutowski incident. Uh, there's some back, there's some uh, backflow uh, internally from that. The Can- you know, the National Defense is telling us that we have to re- still request for it and uh, you know, so all these other things. So from my, uh, understanding is they've stopped giving that information to Chris now. So, so, and with Otis explaining the process in such a, such a well, uh, articulate way on how to access the information, what we're doing, more people can do. What I want is when those documents come out is to, to share them with us or let at least tip me off so I can add that to the database because with the timeline, I'm starting to see, you know, like, you know, it's not just like a 1952 project, uh, you know, uh, magnet happened. It was like, and then it was like four days later, this event happened or, or, or two days later, this event happened. And then three days later, the project was created. You start to see all these events in close proximity. Time is very important. We all know these events, but like if it happened within like a seven year span, sure. But like those UFO reports, everything, and those are credible documents. Those are the best source documents. And of course, when we get our civilian reports, I add them to the database too on the unidentified ones. Um, And um, we start to get more information too. Actually, like this book here behind me. The other thing that was frustrating is is that first document that Otis got, that service document that he found, was the document that I released in 2019. So it's right here in this book. Uh, and I gave that to Chris thinking, hey, man, this is something that you use, something that you need. Can you make this public because you have all that? And and he didn't. And, it, and a year later, Otis found it. And that's how we got connected. I remember having a conversation with you. It was like, who the hell? Like, how the hell? who the hell is this guy? You know, that's my, that's my file. And you knew that. And then, so, so that kind of goes, you know, goes to that. But to, as an example, what we're doing, what I'm doing with these documents, sure, he's writing the story, but what I'm doing is I'm actually investigating it as far as I can go, assuming that the government gave me all the evidence that they have. And my perspective is, is they don't have time. Like Otis said, it's not a threat, but it also could be just they're you know they're just giving us a little bit not looking into it so when i right. do my investigative part i'm coming to similar conclusions but there are still things that can't be explained like bright lights chasing objects right. uh, and ch- chasing aircrafts all right i want to bring john in here the fedora wearing yeah, john hudson in regards to this as an outsider looking into you know what is happening north of the border here john we see a little bit of a different game being played than what we see in the United States, a lot of closed mindedness, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, conjecture going on to, we really need to be talking about this topic in Canada yet in the United States, this is hot button. What do you see the big difference between the two countries? Wow. But it's, it's fascinating. And, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't, hi everybody. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, insult, um, our lovely neighbors up North, but, when you get down to it, like the country of Canada has like what forty two million people. Oh, you're generous. Like that, about thirty seven. You know, about thirty seven. Okay, California has, I believe, forty six, right? Like, like the, just the state of California. There's not actually like a lot of people in Canada, and so I think honestly, the complexity of 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 services in a community it's relational to how big the, the community is. And so even though you're next to a country that has a lot of these stuff implemented, it's because we have like, you know, 300 million people. Right. And so it's just that, you know, Canada's very spread out. And so essentially it's just kind of funny because you guys do this. It, it was, it was a, it was a kind of a, a, a simple enough model that someone just said, Oh, I'll do it. And they got the job. And, you know, you go to smaller and smaller villages in, in other parts of the world and you'll see that same sort of, of structure happen where it's not like a system. It's a guy it's not a system, it's a person, right. That, that have those roles. And so it's, it, it's kind of a throwback to an old, to an old, like, you know, older way of doing things, depending on how complex you are. And, and he, Chris, he just got lucky. Now, I mean, he could have been a more um, eager custodian, right? Like as, as, as custodian of that information, he could have, um, he could have had a, a more, you know, 
like super positive outlook, right? I mean, like, you know, I'm not saying that, but he also could have shut down much more than he did, right? I mean, they really made him the focal point and that that was their doing, not not his. I mean, he just stepped into the role. If he hadn't, someone else would have, you know? And it's, it's just, a, I think it's just a factor of what happened, you know? I think it's just unfortunate that he behaved that way, but our, but arguably that's his choice. And there's a percentage of the population would probably do the same thing. So it's like neither here nor there. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's just, I mean, it's all very interesting, um, but I don't I don't really know. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, but wow. Like what a, um, what, yeah. What an odd experience. You mentioned, you mentioned something that kind of jogged my brain too. Proximity is very important too. So like NORAD has two bases, one here in Ontario, but the first one is actually in Manitoba. So, so like, like he is the rep in that area. He's, he's from Manitoba. So like he could have very well showed up and walked over uh, to, uh, to that place to make that deal. I've also, so part of this investigation process too is, is I did a freedom of information request on everything the government has on Rutowski. Uh, and, and Otis has that too. And only some of that got into, it was relevant for a story, but everything else just basically, you know, like the, the explanation was, is this is what we're, tr- we're supposed to do and all these other things too. And, 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 and it's because he was at a, at the government, at a government in- institution. He's a media guy for the, the university of Manitoba. So, so a government entity is passing information to another government employee, so, so, so there, they got to look at the context. So, so that there is a lot of room uh, to suggest that that handshake agreement was like, yeah, we'll give it to you, but you keep it secret. And, you know, so because uh, his career mandates it, he's a media guy. And that's the thing is when, when I knew the story, I knew the story for all the whole time. But the problem was, is he's the guy in the media. So it took me uh, to get, uh, to give, you know, actually, Dave Scott convinced me to trust Otis to give my leads to uh, to him. And I was very hesitant on that the whole way through. And then when the story finally came out, that's when I realized, like, you know what? That guy did a good job because he also didn't he, he got me validation, but he also didn't hang Rutowski, uh so much that he's still able to keep his job. Right, 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 right. Right. So 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 yeah, if it was me who wrote that article, he'd be out of a job right now. So it's, right. so it's kind of good to have that objective, uh, that approach, but that's still, for, I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to trust them. It's kind of a bummer, but, but it's not it's like, I don't think there was any, I, I don't think there was anything malicious that went on. I think, you know, I think just, it was, there was differences of opinions, differences yeah, of style. And it, it, it came down to a, like, essentially a local policy thing, mm-hmm. right? It was you know? an agreement. He didn't do anything wrong. It, the, who who did it? What where it failed? It was the government gave it to a civilian. And yep. da- and, and Dave, you 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 hit it on the button with your one on one there. That the problem is, is it belongs to all of us. And and, and the government now also uh, responded said the intent was that by giving it to him that he would give it to everyone. And so so you know you know you can throw money and books and all that other stuff in the, in the mix and and that's the human. You know, uh, at the Experience Your Support Association, we're not studying the phenomenon, we're studying the people. And, and and that includes everybody in the phenomenon and why they are the way that they are. And that's how I'm going to get disclosure by figuring out, you know, who's doing what they're doing. Uh, not by looking at lights in the sky. It's, it's, you know, there's lots of other things going on than just, you right. know, weather phenomenon. So Yeah, it's like, wow. It's, and, uh, and it's, uh it's to me it's it's just I don't it's know. information though it's what the facts are the government has been honest or at least releasing information for some time i like that they they've been giving it out they've declassified documents there's over nine thousand five hundred documents i have many of those behind me that that you know that i'm transcribing getting up onto the website do some we know how much do we know how much data he got? Do we know like how like how? Well, no, like, and he's not going to release that because he's got a book coming out, and that's the other thing too. Is it, is as soon as that book comes out, I'll be checking that book to see if that has anything to do. So 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 here's the thing: is following those leads go, um, and and go back to Dave's point is is how do I feel about? me being denied that hasn't been confirmed yet but when his book comes out or whenever he releases a document um i'll know that because when i pulled his file i have everything that they gave him so i'm waiting to see what he releases and when he releases it because i bet it's in that book 
And if it's in that book, then we have that motive to show that why he was holding on to it, it was to make the sale. Now, whether or not that's ethical and honest and all that other stuff, I, I'm not here to, uh, you know, to me for, for, to get the answers on the, uh, for, on behalf of the entire country as a Canadian citizen, that's wrong. However, he's not the only person who's done that. So, so there's, there's that industry issue. We have a social problem within, in, and I'm using that as an example. He's still a human being. He was given the information. He had an opportunity. He cashed in on it. Now he's off the mountain. And, and, and I don't want to continue to trash him, but, I, but now no. he's starting to release these documents. And then now we can rebuild this trust and he can, and, and, and he can, you know, start to start to do things right. And then that's where we get the change. And, it and will be interesting if we, if, if we find out, you know, what, what the nature, not only the nature of the data he received, but what were the catalysts for the data he received it? Like did, did everyone that filed, I, I, I forget what your guys' system is called. It's not um, a FOIA. It's um, ATI uh, access to information. ATI. ATI. So, yeah. so, you know, you file one of these requests, um, you know, just like, you know, how, how does that, how does that exchange like, you know, like, go and I, I don't know it's just um i i, I don't know it's just well it's it's, it's a quite lot, simple a lot can be it's actually more out simple. later like otis is very careful uh on on how he explains things and i understand that because uh he doesn't want his stuff to be scooped he doesn't want uh, there's other people trying to get this information out there but was uh, everything funneled through that i mean did, did, like did if anyone made a, made the request at any time did it go through him and then he was the one that sent it out to them was he was he like a focal point well the, that, that was what was told in the media with another side of uh, uh, uh the other side of the group so there's another circle um that that chris is is part of there's another circle in which uh, dave and i uh, well i'm kind of i'm not in a circle because i'm i'm an investigator but uh, the, but the circle that dave's in you know there are uh okay i'll give you an example i found it very interesting that grant cameron um mentioned this but he mentioned a researcher so he didn't name Chris, but I know that he worked in the same university as Chris. Like I know that they know each other. So so I was like, yeah, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you, mention, why wouldn't you mention? Why wouldn't you mention that? Lovely. Yeah. So so so, but on that Chris side of things, with the uh, his UFO survey that he puts in the media, what he did is he went around and got the information from MUFON Canada. From, from he try, you know, when I worked at MUFON Canada, I was involved in doing that, and I poked holes in that because the information that he was putting on there was inaccurate. He wasn't putting all the good, juicy ones. He was, he was, he was dumbing it down. He was massaging the data, and I was able to prove that. So, so, so he could be, you know, he might have been tasked to do that survey because that survey didn't come out until 1980, uh, 80ish. But he had already been getting the information from the government in the 70s. So, 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 so something happened where he's collecting this. And then when I got involved with MUFON, the thing was, okay, pass your information to Chris. Chris will do the survey. It goes out in the media. And this was the thing. But then I started saying, like, you know, when I got on this bug, it's like, how come he's not mentioning MUFON? Because, because like 80% of the reports that are in there are ours. So how come we're not in the media? And, and that's when, you know, I started looking at it a little bit closer and did the data and found all these other things out. And then turns out that, there, you know, by crapping on him he contacted mufon hq and the mutant mufon hq tried to you know hey he's a friend of ours yeah why he's lying so there's a whole bunch of stuff so 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 that's my perspective that would agree that that there was some sort of of plan to with uh, to at least regulate or control the media because he's also a media guy so does the punishment fit the crime the intent you know like what i would really like is one day is is for to do this round robin like this sneak me in on on an interview with chris because i would like to ask him these questions because he won't talk to me and he won't because he's a media guy so it, it's frustrating because that's the protocol for media don't say anything and it'll go away well and, and then so so is it wrong? Is he, is he, so he's not lying because he's not it's saying wrong. anything. It's, it's wrong, but it's wrong by policy. So he's doing yeah. what he's being asked to do and he's doing that well. But and he still, so, ha like, he still needs know, to explain himself. He still needs to. Well, 
what's going to be interesting is is when that does happen. Well, you know, yeah. and I'm and I'm talking years from now. Whenever you know years yeah. go by, at some point in the future, he'll be able to talk, and it's like, and it's going to be really because the thing is, is that I find it kind of funny. Like for you, Dave, there's that one um, organization, B, uh, BF, uh, the Bigfoot, the the one that was like BFRO. stripping the woo. BFRO, it yeah. was stripping Wu out of reports because they, they wanted them to meet this certain classification of, of physical attributes and so forth. And so you have like, you know, them altering that data. And then here you have someone funneling, tuning and, and you know, weeding out the data and, and only giving out what they think is right. Like no one was getting a clear picture of anything. But the opportunity was there. That's the thing. So, so let's give it yeah. the benefit of the doubt. Chris was. Uh, we have a lot of data to support that maybe he was he was tasked to cover it up. Maybe he wasn't, and then he just he just he just for some reason decided to, uh, not to. Or maybe he believed he was doing the best he could with what he knew. And 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 the people, you know, there's a lot of positives. Yeah. Yep. That's why he needs to be here. Uh, but he he won't talk to me, and I and I, I don't blame it. A lot of people won't talk to me because I'm an act. I'm I've been privately investigating the phenomenon for since 2015. I'm a I'm a licensed investigator. I own my own private investigating firm. All right, I, guys. I put my. I'm gonna get you Sorry. both to hold on right there, yeah. and I apologize for cutting you off. No, no, it's okay. Uh, we do have to go to break here. Oh. We have John Hudson, the fedora wearing UFO wonder, and Ryan Stacy. From tessacan.org, the Experiencer Support Association. When we return, more UFO talk outside of Canada and in on Spaced Out Radio in Hour 3. All right, boys, we're clear. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm glad I'll you be right said back, that. Guys. I think it's totally possible that, that, you know, that a lot of this was just was just the human nature of the people involved right it was just it was their style of doing things or it was their you know it, it may it may have had some you know just honest you know yeah. just misguided you know um motivations to them and it just it just escalated into a bigger problem because mm -hmm. of the nature of of the information that we're talking about well, well that's the thing is they played the media game right he's he he still has a chance to clear his name and i mean uh, uh, and by avoiding it is good i mean like i mean that's why I'm trying to say say both sides because the objectiveness too is there's still a, a side that I haven't gotten yet to hear him out. Maybe if I had a conversation with him like this and be like, you know what, I never hated you, or you know what, I never did this, and this is why, and it would make sense. But the avoidance part is what turned around and bit him in the butt because he avoided it for so long because he knew he had control of the media. And then and then with Otis, like I mean, like but he it does not mean in his role he he cannot go totally clean we have to like basically wait till he retires or something i have no idea i i i emailed his employer and, and asked uh you know if if this was behavior in which they condoned or were aware of and tolerable that wasn't as a private that wasn't as a ufo investigator that was straight up for my private investigating firm i got confirmation from another ufologist who's close with chris that that message was received but the university still has not responded to my email, right? Because I, uh, you know, I gotta send a lawyer, I gotta sue, I gotta find criminal, you know, I gotta find that criminal, uh, that criminal stuff for me to pursue it that far. So for me, I mean, everybody is a suspect in this disclosure movement. It's it's just everybody does a little. Everyone's trying. There's a lot of intent. And when you withhold something, if you're doing it for money, then okay, yeah, this is a thankless job. There's bills to pay, but say that, you know, I got some stuff. I'm going to let it out. Uh, it's going to be in my book. And then, uh, and then I'll release it to the public for everyone else to have it. But like, if you got something, put it out there. Oh yeah. I, no, I mean, I mean, we, we've, we've seen that ourselves recently. I mean, in, 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 our, in our country, there was times this, this past election where, where people were actually withholding information that would have been very pertinent mm -hmm. in several of the major lawsuits that occurred toward the end of that year. And their books didn't come out till January, you know, for like Christmas. And like, yeah. and it had all this stuff in it that yeah. like if we'd known back in July, it would have had made a really big deal. And they held it for profit, right? And, well, they, like, and, and also with journal, journalism and stuff like that, too, they only they're only allowed to uh, release their source documents based on what's in the story. So, so sometimes, uh, like Otis, for an right. example, he's he, he, you know, one of his documents had um, 
was like a, a seven page document, but he only released two, two of those pages because those were what was relevant to the story and what, uh, and what he was sharing as an investigator. Like, like editor. You yeah. Know, like, the, like yeah. Editors, yeah. Of course, because they, you know, whatever perspective and rules that they had. So he's even suppressed right. in some ways, but at least it's, at yep. least the editor is allowing it to be posted. Yes. So that's, that's also, you know, take, that's I'll take progress. the edit. That's progress. Uh, <laughs> and, but the thing is from an investigator point of view, I'm looking at this file. I got information. I go put boots on the ground to find out after the fact that there were seven, after I got my copy of it, uh, that there was uh, five missing pages, which, you know, was frustrating for me, but it's not his fault. It's just, it's just the way the industry works. There's a lot of industry problems. It's not. No, what I've been curious about with your system is that yeah. in, the, in the U S um, well, no one likes to talk about it because everyone likes to have so much faith in something. Mm -hmm. The, the FOIA process is, is not perfect. Um, mm -hmm. there is a tremendous amount of stuff that goes on that is FOIA exempt. And in honesty, it's it's the coolest stuff that goes on that's FOIA exempt, right? Like that yeah. that's the most extreme stuff. That's the most, you know, outward focus. I mean that you know, that's those are gonna be the most extreme cases. And so it's 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 I don't know, it's um Well it comes it, back to the why. Why exempt, right? We assume that it's a secret, uh, and it's something that we, we need to have. But right. But what I'm curious also... about you know, I'm sorry. What I'm curious about is though, is that we know that we get we get a, a limited slice. Do you, yeah. do you are you guys in the same position? Do you know for a fact that there is a a, a group a group of things in your that are exempt from your policy, or do you know that not not that it, I know of, the, not that I know of. All I know is I ask if they don't have anything, they tell me they don't. If they do have it, they give it to me. Okay, so 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 you, so you can go on some uh, some amount of reasonable faith that if they give you everything, you actually get you yeah. actually got everything. Yeah, I okay, have so enough. We, we with, can't assume that, yeah. which is which is 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 a is a really unfortunate. Side well, I I don't course. assume it, assume that they're giving me everything, but I know they're giving me more leads right. to follow well, I mean, than yeah, there could be always, America's yeah, I mean, giving you. Yeah, no, I, yeah, can, I mean there I could can, always be. Yeah, it's it's not they it's not instantly, instantly perfect because of that, but it, it it means that they're gonna. You know, I mean, it's gonna work out better that way. So well, we, um, these service documents uh, those are those have been designed um, uh, for us to fill out to give to us to continue said investigations. We got one so minute, disclosure. Boys. On your end will help us too because they might be U.S. might be continuing the investigations, and we just take it. We got less than one minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. No. No. It's. It's. Um. I mean. Oh. Uh. What kind of data? What, like. How, what kind of database is the stuff stored in? Uh Well, they're like you mean the system. Like what like software? All, all the reports, all, all the reports, all, right, all this data that's created. We'll, 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 cut, we'll take it up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Tim, Ed, Thomas, Snakes, Cat, Todd, and Rex for the amazing super chats tonight. Really do appreciate each and every one of you hanging on out and supporting this show. Thank you to everybody who's given us a thumbs up, thumbs down tonight. We're going to continue with the UFO talk here momentarily. Don't forget, you can do some shopping. Spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop. Here we go, everyone. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Dapocaginus. Dapocaginus is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, on TikTok, 
at Spaced Out Radio as well. We continue on tonight with UFO Talk. Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association is here, along with the fedora-wearing John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report. And gentlemen, you know, when we look at disclosure, we see things kind of rolling the way they are both in the United States and around the world. This topic continues to be hot button, even though it is hot and then it's cold down and then it's hot once again. You know, we're coming close to the end of the year here. And John, what do you see happening between now and the end of the year regarding any sort of movement towards disclosure, government assistance in this topic as we see new uh, new motions being put forward? What do you see happening? It depends on on how that um and how what you know what how long it takes to get all those bills signed into law. And if, you know, if they I mean, because the thing is, is that the, the thing I really like about what, what was just uh, written up by um, by Joel Gillibrand is is it um, is that it's 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 pretty well structured. It's I mean, it's it goes into a lot of you know, it goes into a fair amount of detail of how certain things should be set up and certain things should be done, and it's it's you know, it's it's much more flushed out than any of the other you know language we've seen. And so, to me, it would indicate that essentially, as soon as the funding gets enabled. You're going to see a little bit of an explosion of 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 activity. That it's going to involve assignments to all those different roles and so forth. And you know that I mean that could happen before Christmas. I mean you know we don't we don't know when that bill will be signed. So I think that could have a really interesting impact, especially depending on who the different people from different org you know do it. Then the other thing is that when this I think was one of the best parts of what's going on these days is that there's so many things happening from so many very different 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 places. That my guess is, is the top two or three th- interesting things that happens over the next two months will be from categories we'd never even thought of. They'll be from some left, you know, left side, you know, category. It's like, oh, I, I, I didn't expect to get data from there. You know, it, it's to me, it, it's one of the most fascinating things that you have all these um, just vastly different data types. And, you know, that's why I was asking you about the database before, because I was wondering, like, like, how are you storing all your information and how do you make it accessible to people? Because, you know, that in itself becomes a big problem, too, because essentially, if we're all collecting data and we're not collecting it in a way that we ourselves can share it, you know, then what's, you know, what's the point in, in you know, in doing it, right? I can try to explain it. I could also share my screen and show you um, to make it easier. But for the listeners, uh, like again, so like on the website, tessacan.org, again, you, you just go there, you go, there's an investigative portal. Uh, you, you basically go, I got to look at it, but you know, you look for the data sets or you look for the visual evidence display. You just basically explore that panel and then you'll see the Canadian document events. You'll see timelines. You'll see all this other stuff. Oh, so you put on. a little, inter- a little web interface on it so people can actually query the data. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. sweet. So, so we transcribe the document. So, so, so here's the thing. So I got a document like. I got to find a document that's not uh, classified. Uh, so, so like this document here, it's a text. This is the other problem too. Let's take Greenwald for an example. Like he, he, he releases documents all over the place, all over the time. And then he blogs about it, but there's some speculation in there. So some opinion in there and there's some facts. There's a lot of good work in that. But for me, as an investigator who's trying to catch up on those things, there's no, I can't search it. I can't keyword. I can't, I'm looking for something. I can't track it. So what I do with my team is we have them. Okay, here's a new doc. This one's current. Okay. And I, you know, if Otis puts one out, I prioritize like based on things that come out, this is new, get it out there, give credit where it's due transcribe it so we use some software to transcribe it real quick then we put it on the website so that way on the website if you go to the search panel and i want to search ufo or i want to search a name and we start to get these trends then you do, all the articles will come up there's a point of interest part so where where again it'd be easier to show you but on the website the points of, uh, the points of interest you'll be able to see the names of everyone that's mentioned in these documents as i as i've been putting them up the locations the objects all that other stuff as well as links to those articles within the site. So, so that way you can start to see a pattern and be like, okay, this guy was mentioned, uh, you know, if as an investigator, I don't care who they are. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. I'm looking for the pattern. So this guy has been mentioned five times. These are all the articles. I'm going to take a little closer look into this guy. So he's now a suspect, a point of interest. That's how, you know, that investigative method. Then that same data is also put on a timeline so, so you can look at the time proximity and see, okay, that's weird. In 52, okay. this happened, and then this thing happened. Okay, and then you click on it, brings you to the same document. Wow. Then we also have the visual evidence database where, where I'm, I'm finding the exact location of where the event took place. 
So then it's not, so it's not the building, it's whatever they're talking about. It's this is where the optic is. And then you start to see visual patterns. And then also with the Experience Support Association, we investigate paranormal, ghosts, DT, monsters, everything, because we believe and consciousness, because we believe it's all connected, that, 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 that the contactee, all that other stuff, too. And as an example on their visual evidence database in, in uh, Moose Jaw, Canadian Forces based Moose Jaw, um, there are two reports. My mom was born. Oh, really? Nice. <laughs> there are Moose two Jaw. reports that are on there from government sources that I've, I've retrieved. Uh, that's been uh, transcribed and put there that describe an orange orb like uh, thing in the sky. There's no physical evidence. There's no direct evidence. However, with the civilian stuff, I got I got a report that came in in 2019 and I had the civilian draw what they saw. It looks like visually what this person, what the military sources had described 30 some odd years prior. But the thing is with proximity was we have a government source. We have a civilian source. Civilian on its own is not enough. Government is not giving us enough, but together combined, um, right. I'm seeing that they, the, the, the location of these events are within four to five kilometers away from each other. That is a different set of data. So when, so when a journalist writes this story and there's a document, that's great. But we, there's so much data that, that, that can be extracted from that and split into many different ways. And that's what I'm who, doing. Who, uh, who, uh, do you mind me asking, yeah. who, who, who paid for, I mean, once you get this all running, it's, it's, it's probably going to not be too bad. But who, yeah. who, who paid for the building of all, this whole data set? Like, you know, in this, and, you know, I mean, who, 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 who backs this financially? Cause this isn't, oh, I, I paid you for can't it. do this for free. You, you, do, you pay for it yourself. I, pay for, I own a private investigating company. Uh, it's, it's, and this is what I do for a living every day. I'm, I'm either looking for someone who, uh, who is skipping out on bail, who, who's cheating oh, on their husband or their wife. Oh, 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 I do this oh, for a I, living. I see. That so sort of me, database. Would, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so no, so it's just okay. using the same tools oh, and resources right. oh, I already okay. have. One at a time, guys. Privately. One at a time. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I use the same resources that are already available to my private clients, and I make it available to people in the public. I just don't share my private stuff with, uh, you know, in the public. So these are tools and resources that are available. So to answer your question, how can you help? Well, when when there's something of significance, you let us know. We put it on the database. I I mean, I could I I'm only focusing on Canada because I'm Canadian, and that's also uh, the hole that's that hasn't been explored yet. We might have answers for you. So I'm kind of, you know, doing it, doing it that way. But if somebody wanted to take significant documents from the U.S. and do the same thing, I can add them to the database. I just give you instructions on what I'm looking for. And then we add it, give you credit where it's due. And then that database starts to build. Did you look in at all about what about Valet's database for um, for OSAP? This this basically 11 database conjunction of of did you, did you get a chance to look into any of that get, yeah yeah so that? so he's measuring he's measuring things differently it's a different type of measurement so those are good there's lots of databases there's lots of classification systems we have our own classification system it's called the ultra spectrum classification system which is an advanced version of the Heineck and valet scale um but from my perspective i'm looking for who or what is responsible um, I'm looking at this as criminal activity. This is something invading our airspace. This and, and yeah. the abduction phenomenon. These are intruders. Yeah. These are people kidnapping our people. These are people, uh, you know, possibly sexually assaulting our people, yeah. you know, in the abduction phenomenon. I don't care if it's an alien. I don't care if it's a ghost. I don't care what you call it. You're oh. still something is still happening to you and you're not the only one. So I, I'm looking yeah. for a person to arrest or to charge that's that's my that's my mode or my my method and that's Just, why i was so uh, set on chris because i knew he was part of the problem oh you gotcha know? gotcha and i and i was yeah, looking no, at him as a criminal yeah, yeah, not, so, yeah, yeah. not as a ufologist and that's yeah what I got. yeah Right. Yeah. Well, so, well, no, I mean, that just maps really well. Right. I mean, like yeah. you just that, that, you know, just it's very for basically we are all very lucky that you happen to have a job that reskinned can basically provide everything you're doing for the, you know, this community as far as collecting data and so forth. And that's just to all of our benefits. And, and on, as a side note, thank thanks. you. Like, th thank you for doing that. Well, like, I appreciate that. That's, that. You know, there, that, that's, that, you know, that's not are, a small amount of effort, but um, it's a big what I'm going to say really quick is it, is it, you know, if you, we, uh, what, what frustrates me is that I, 
I, you know, I've done some work in like big data type um, uh, machine learning type environments. And mm -hmm. essentially, you know, when you normalize your data enough and you get enough data, like you get a really a large amount of data, mm -hmm. you can start gleaning some really interesting things about what's going on. And, you know, we need to, and I don't know how we do this, but we, and maybe what's in this bill will, will help make it happen. But we need to get to a point where we have we're slurping in all of these databases, like every mm -hmm. single one we can get our hands on. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if right now the answer to a lot of our questions are out there. They're floating out there. Well, and I we believe just have, well, yep, the answers are we there. Have, it's just nobody's connecting the dots. Yep. I, I, I so Canada believe has declassified so 9,500 documents and no one has done what I've done with the documents. And that's where I'm frustrated because I look at a couple documents and I, and I can solve a couple riddles. I'm like, well, that makes sense. On to the next, like by looking yep. at it differently, it's a different perspective. Um, and there are a lot of people putting the effort out there. These databases are important. It depends on what they're measuring and what their goal is. The other thing too, with our, ultra spectrum classification system is is i'm recategorizing the events i'm taking i'm acknowledging the archetypes so so let's take ufo and uap for an example okay so so a lot of people still float on the fence on whether or not what what's a ufo and what's a uap so to break that down it could be a machine or a light it doesn't matter what it is those are two categories it's either a machine or it's a light mm -hmm. you can call it those mm -hmm. names whatever mm -hmm. but this is mm -hmm. these fit the characteristics of that both could be extraterrestrial uh, or both could be military. We don't know, but you know, that's kind of, so we're, we're investigating that differently. And then also allows the paranormal community to have their data quantified because that, that is skeptical in many senses, because what's the difference between a UFO orb of light or a paranormal orb of light? We don't know that, but it's still, it's still testimonial data that can be used. So if we, if we break it down that now, how do I get both parties to agree on the same data, the academic community and paranormal community getting along with you? each other is we call it aerial activity because it's we would agree both sides would have to agree that it's in the air it's active you guys can speculate on your own religions and faiths and all that other stuff on on on, on what it is uh and then we get down to the sensory display which is identifying the method in which you've seen it because there's evidence that shows that you've seen it with your eyes you're able to take a photo of it or you saw it in your mind mind or you heard it or you felt it all that information is valid and whether you believe in those pseudosciences or not what's common is that they're all seeing the same thing what's different is we all are able to see it in a different with using a different sense all mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. all right Ryan, when, when you come down to the bare taxes of what's happening with disclosure we, mm -hmm. we hear that it has to come out of the United States. Everything seems to be trickled through there. And, and if you look at the five eyes, which is the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, we see a lot of, of things happening along that route and sharing of information of UFO phenomena as well. The other countries, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, they've all had discussions on what the Americans have brought up here recently. And I asked Daniel Otis this earlier, but are you quite surprised that this subject has not reached the public part of the House of Commons yet? No, I'm not really surprised because, uh, I mean, the, the, the again, uh, like looking at the evidence and me looking at it in, in detail, uh, there doesn't, and with my background as investigating UFO sightings with MUFON for many years, over thousands of, of sighting reports, I'm not yet, I'm not satisfied that there's enough evidence to suggest the extraterrestrial origin or a connection with, with the phenomenon. So, so even when I'm looking at Canadian documents, I go back to a 1952 document, you know, there's conversations about it being German technology back in the Cold War. And there's enough factual evidence at that point to suggest that that might be plausible then, but then we don't hear anything about it. So like, maybe that was the truth. Maybe they just knew. And then, and, and, and here's the thing is that the five eyes, like you said, we're all look at, look at it as businesses. United States is the, is, is in charge of a lot of things in the world. Canada needs us for a lot of things, trades and things like that. With the pandemic, we learned there's certain things that uh, they, they stop helping us with and things like that. There's a lot of, lot of issues with being neighboring countries um 
but the fact of the matter is, if the United States is 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 in charge of everything and we know the answers, uh, it, it wouldn't be very strategic for the Canadian government to come out and be like, yeah, it's just this, it's just government tech because they know. So so they might just my perspective is they're just they're avoiding it because but they know that's why they don't care because they know the truth. And, and it's important for the United States, you know, and then we watch to see what the states do to kind of speculate that because there are no board, no borders with UFOs, you know. So whatever this is, these these five eyes, these alliances weren't created until after all this stuff has happened. Well, so but yeah, happened. but do keep in mind is that there, there, there is a certain amount of territory beyond the U.S., where we signed treaties with countries mm -hmm. as we went into a system mm -hmm. to build themselves that they had to do things like automatically give us jurisdiction to any. So, I mean, there's been a lot of crashes down in South America that mm -hmm. we've recovered. The local mm -hmm. government hasn't kept right mm -hmm. now. I'd love to think that all the data that we pull on that ship back up in the United States gets sent in a nice envelope with a bow down mm -hmm. to those researchers in Mexico, but I get a sinking little feeling that that doesn't happen, right? So the information is being consolidated mm -hmm. um, you know, in the U.S. more so than it probably is anywhere else, right? And from a business perspective, that makes sense because we don't know what it is. What if it is a biological weapon? What if it gets in the wrong hands? Like, we got to tr sure. trust your governments a little bit too. So, 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 like, I, you know, if we trust them, that they are protecting the information for a valid reason, it's a little easier to accept and make sense of all this. Where we yes. get this speculation, where we get this this stuff is we think because we get robbed on our taxes, because we lose on, on health care, and we and we suffer in other areas, we assume that they're 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 lying here too. But what if this is a, a boy who cried wolf scenario? Maybe they are telling us the truth. So because and I'm willing to take back that statement uh, once we get disclosure. That means you guys were right, and I and and I was wrong. But I, I'm, I look at both sides, and when I and when I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and look at it as a business, I mean, there's a lot of personal information uh, that and a lot of people that could be harmed in releasing said information. So these, you know, what are they protecting? It's not maybe it's not the craft, or maybe it's not the technology. Maybe it's you know, the livelihood, because us as, a, as, as people will respond to that. We are very violent and, and uh, aggressive people when we don't get what we want. Uh, and, and science has shown that, you know. So, I mean, it's a good strategy. Again, uh, it's just a different way of thinking about it. I, no, I, and the thing is, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I think a lot of these questions don't even end up being bullying anymore. They just end up being, you know, a little bit of each, you know, I think, in, mm -hmm. I think in some cases it is American tech. Like I, you take like the Calvine case, yeah. the one that, you know, had that triangle on, on the poster on, on mm -hmm. Nick Pope's, you know, back wall yeah. that I now believe was a U.S. program. I really do. I really and, believe that. And, but and so, but that's going to happen once in a while. Some of them are going to be U.S. programs. Some of them are going to be, you know, something local that, that is mm -hmm. from around here. Maybe something is, some of it's going to be from off planet. Maybe mm -hmm. the ones that are off planet, there's going to be five different versions. Of, I mean, there could be a lot of different things mm -hmm. doing this, and but they're all doing it in a similar enough way. But, and are, are, are passive enough to us that we're grouping them all together in one big ball. What I like is that is that the government knows about it. The government has it. So so it's not out in the air. It's not attacking us. It's not doing right. anything. It's not dangerous right now. Yeah. So if they're not telling us, at least it's contained. And you know what? It's a secret. Fine. Why would it be a secret? Well, why do we keep other things a secret? Because the entire world gets the information. If they have technology that could win the mm -hmm. next war, I would keep that secret in case the next war happens. So there's, there's a lot of logical explanations for the lies yeah. or the secrecy, but they're not explaining that either. You know, like, you know, that would help too to be like, yeah, it's ours. Uh, yeah. just, it's yeah. like the Rutowski thing again. They're not saying anything. Yeah. At instead, all. Of, instead of like pretending that they're, 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 they're being all shadowy about it, just yeah. tell us, hey, we're censoring this. This is how much we're censoring. This is why we're censoring it that much. This is what you get. I mean, just like, just like, mm -hmm. let's just be honest about what you're doing. Like, it, no, one's, no one's pretending that you're not doing this, right? So right. you might as well just let us know how you do it and be done with it. But they're, they're starting that now that you have the, your task force and, and the funding and all that right. other stuff, like that they're starting the process. Maybe this was all part 
part of 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 everything that's that's going. We're moving in that direction. We will get what we're looking for eventually. That scheduled dissemination. But you got to prep the the entire world for it. You look at look at the pandemic. How uh, there's so many. Even today, we're not reacting yeah. in unity. Yeah. That, you oh, know, yeah. so so oh, this yeah. might have been a, a you know for those who believe this was a, you know a planned thing. If it was, we failed that test. You know, if it if it wasn't, we still you know we still oh. got lots to learn. <laughs> you know, so I mean, if I was in the government's oh, position man. and I had technology and I had to give this to uh, open source for anyone to recycle and to use. If I was a betting man, it's gonna it's be a lot. It's gonna be, yeah, it's, it's gonna a lot be more funny harm. Can, yeah, true. That come but, out of know, it. Great power, true. great responsibility, and all those other yeah. things. So I put a little faith and a little trust in our governments that that whatever secrets they're keeping is for a damn good reason. And if it is extraterrestrial contact, I'll speak to those who have those psychic abilities and those paranormal experiences. We know that if they want to contact us, they will. And it's not these machines that we need to see this, you know, it's just there's other things happening to us. And we think that because these things happening to us, it must be linked to that. But we don't even know if that has anything to do with the other phenomenon, which is why at Tesla, we investigate everything. There's like this UFO thing for me is like right here and on this whole rainbow of other things. So. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. Okay. Because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Ryan Stacy from Tessacad. John Hudson, the fedora wearing UFO knot himself. I'm going to see if these guys can stick around for the next half hour, continue the UFO talk. We'll keep Ryan up late on the East Coast. John up early on the West Coast. Let's continue it right after this on Space Out Radio. My voice is so dry tonight. Like right here. So I um I met with this woman once. Um, she was the CTO of um of a a, a large insurance company, and um, I was uh, talking to her, and she you know she, she was saying how she'd recently done a <clears throat> a deep learning project, and I was like, oh, you know, I want you know I want to hear about this, you know. And I used to always ask these kind of these kind of customers I talked to, I'd ask, you know what's something you found that was weird, right? Because very often when you dig through really large data sets, you find weird stuff. And so uh, essentially um, I asked this, you know, CTO, I'm like, what did you, what did you find that was, that was weird, you know? And she kind of smiled at me and, and, you know, and she kind of explained to me they had to, they had to have a team come in, you know, from outside and basically, you know, do this whole analysis thing under data. And it wasn't like a complicated AI thing. It was just a simple, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, data mining sort of operation. And she kind of looked at me and she kind of grinned. She, she's all weird. I'm like, yeah. And she goes, um, people who fish, like not people who fish professionally and not people that just fish once in a while, but those people that fish like, like every year they go on like two or three long week long fishing trips. Those people, those people spend more money on our product are more loyal in, in as customers and 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 provide more elasticity of actual payments from, from over time like those are our best customers and and we found that those the, 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 those are, are related and i'm like mm-hmm. okay so what are you going to do with that information right and mm-hmm. the funny thing is that you have two choices you can say well we'll go advertise the the um you know insurance company at the bait shop and mm-hmm. probably not the best choice you start looking at why it's the fisher people that basically meet this characteristic so well what is it about them that makes them happy customers and then you look for those people in other data sets right but the point is is that you can find some really weird stuff and you would have never expected that really takes you in a completely new direction of trying to figure something out that's incredibly helpful Mm -hmm. you know i mean doing you know doing that like i would love to just do handwriting analysis across everything from 1945 to yesterday, I'd like to. I want to see handwriting analysis on everything in that whole period. I want to find out what's common, what what mm-hmm. matches, what doesn't match, right? What shows trends? What should what, what's a, a baseline we should see over of signature changing over a lifetime? You I mean you can, you can start asking all these mm-hmm. and get all these variations of percentages, and you can glean a lot of really interesting information 
once you start normalizing and pumping that data into a system. Statement analysis would be also a good thing too. Uh, whenever, you know, our, our lovely Lou Elizondo, you know, uh, uh, however, you know, side of the fence he's on, he's done a plethora of oh, yeah. podcasts and said many different things back and forth, but uh, yeah, you could have a wonderful three dimensional topology thing of showing mm-hmm. like, you know, words stated and, and, and you know, when analysis, the words and, yeah, he chooses be, and the awesome. adjectives and everything yeah, yeah, is yeah. important. Oh, that would be awesome. And oh, that would be awesome. I could do it, but he's not on my radar right now. I got other fish to fry. I'll let it, someone it's else hard go. not to really geek out on some of the stuff, man. That's that's mm-hmm. really cool. That's that's actually really really cool. But like, I mean, I'd love to see. I'd love. To, I, hope, God, I would love to see OSAP's database. Oh, uh, yeah. like, well, everybody would, just would get, too. Just, can, we, can we just get a public API? That's be so nice. Just like a public, just some kind of a public web connector of some sort. We can just we can just connect to send queries, get data back. It'd be so mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, but uh, I, it, I, it depends on what you're getting data on. What if it's secret tech? What if it's it's for war? What if it's uh, just in case, well, look, uh, you know, look, break look, the glass kind of, you will know when we need to know. It's their responsibility to, to make sure they don't give me something that's going to, you know, that they shouldn't right. be giving me, right? But mm-hmm. whatever I get, you know, I mean, you know, and that's the whole thing too, is that, is that how much data do you really get? And I think it's, I think for you, I think it's, it's probably likely that the data you get is pretty much the data there. I think one of the big problems in the u.s right now is that so much so many programs are foia exempt Mm -hmm. i mean it's basically anything that's really like fun yeah you gotta ask so speculate around the why why is it yeah well no i know but my point is is that what that means is that we only see the the stuff that made it into foi so we're only Mm -hmm. seeing like a splintering of of the infrastructure the rest mm-hmm. of it was all on the other side and we don't see it and so we're having to make these assumptions mm-hmm. based on a very small amount of data okay and, hold on and inferring guys. you know how to get there you know i've got this shooting pain it. from my wrist right up to my elbow my left what, 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 what? shooting pain been there like a day and a half it's Uh-oh. just annoying the crap out of me right now anyways uh big thank you to tim ed thomas snakes cat todd and Rex, for the amazing super chats, really do appreciate it. Don't forget, you can shop for your SOR swag on our website. And, of course, you can give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, whatever you feel. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. We're going the distance tonight, right now. Third, we're heading for home tonight on Space Town Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Check out our new TikTok. We haven't put any videos out yet. We're going to be doing that soon, but it's at Spaced Out Radio on TikTok. For the final time tonight, we introduce our guest from Tessa Can, which is the Experiencers Support Association, Ryan Stacy. And the fedora wearing John Hudson is here as well, hanging on out and checking it out with us, talking to UFOs all night long. Gentlemen, in regards to the way the research is going, there is a current narrative narrative that is happening and taking place, and it continues within the U.S. government as they try and figure out what is going on with this UFO phenomena. John, I want to start with you about this because I believe it's Senator Gillibrand who has a new... A proposal up on the table if you want to break that down yeah so this is um this, this is uh this is a really nice turn of events and uh, you know i honestly this is kind of what i was hoping was going to happen because originally the the wording that was in the senate um version of the bill before was just kind of carbon copy of what we already had before with the uaptf 
and it was it was really the house that first introduced a new language that was you know far more aggressive and and you know looked for an office to be created and and you know set up some other things but it was still very kind of vague and it, it's you know but it did a lot more than any other group did and then that basically triggered then the Senate to come back and say, oh, OK, you guys will really want to do something. So we'll take that wording and we'll also go back and we'll pull stuff from here. We'll pull stuff from there. You know, there, there's some indication that some of um, some language from one of um, Science Bob's uh, papers ended up in there. There's some rumor going around that um, Chris Mellon uh, might have had some influence over some of it. Uh, you know, there might have been a lot of input. But the but the nut of it is, is that it ended up with being a pretty nice Really written, you know, um, uh, attachment, and, and it it builds it all out really nicely, and it gets into a lot of detail and says, you know, um, you know, NASA must supply this many people to this committee, and you know, uh, Galileo should, must, you know, appoint this many people to this committee, and and it kind of goes through and it very clearly lays out like what the level, you know, structures are, what the layers are, what the oversight is. I mean, it it builds out a nice. You know, I mean, there's still you could still flush out a lot of detail, but, you know, it, it is a really, really good beginning. And, it, and it's written in a way that I think that as soon as you get funding, you can basically start 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 on it, because essentially there's enough there that I think you can you can get moving to a certain degree. And so um, it's it's a really good thing. And, and when we first heard about it, we didn't know if it was going to catch on because you know a lot of people make pr make proposals for amendments and just you know you never hear about them again they just they, they don't get anyone's attention so they just you know die in the weeds and um and so and she hadn't even done a press conference on it yet but then over the last couple of days we've seen a lot of different uh, media operations basically pick up that article and, and 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 spread it around and so i'm hoping that we drum up enough attention that it you know people start paying attention and and you know that might really have an impact so that's you know i mean that's good stuff you John, know, it's, it's all just baby steps. Why is Senator Gillibrand really hot to trot on the UFO topic? Um, so I don't know for sure. Um, but if I had to guess, it's probably because she saw one when she was a little kid and she's always known they were real. I mean, honestly, like it's probably something like that. She's probably had some heard some story from a best friend, some story from a, 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 a cousin or she saw something herself or she just really always liked the idea that there were you know people from another planet. I think she I think people I think people in, in these roles look for projects that they can personally get invested in, that they personally have a good feeling about that means something to them because it makes it easier to drive your your passion when you feel that way, if you want something out of something. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's purely just, you know, she has a fascination for it and she just took the opportunity to get involved. Ryan, up here in Canada, I don't know if you have sources in Ottawa or not because I don't really discuss your sources with you, but... From what you're hearing, are a lot of Canadian politicians paying attention to what is happening in the United States regarding this subject? Well, so as a private investigating firm, I do, I do have, I do have sources that do speak to me. I mean, there is chatter, but I mean, they they're young. So, like, so the so for me, from my perspective, these this is a generational thing. Uh, they're trying to get, uh, you know, the older, the older ones, to, to, to share some stuff. And, um, I mean, a lot of them are experiencers themselves and, and, uh, they're, you know, I don't know, they, they, they kind of encourage the civilian side of things. So they're getting the message out, getting more people together, bringing that data. I know, I know that they're paying attention to what I'm saying and what we're doing. Uh, you, you know, I, I know that when I do my my access to information requests, uh, you know, I can tell, uh, that, you know, I, I keep track of who responds and uh, emails right. and things like that. And I formulate professional relationships. I'm not aggressive when I ask for this information, you know, please. And thank you. That, that, that courtesy kind of goes a long way. So I've gotten to, um, some Canadian, Canadian. Yeah. It's a book. Yeah. So, like, but I've gotten to a place where, um, I've explored the liberties by saying, Hey, can I have some questions? Would you mind helping me? And they've been helpful. So I'm kind of exploring that. So I wouldn't necessarily say I have direct sources, but I do have an open line of communication that seems to be working at this stage. 
Uh, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, that the, like what, what Otis was saying earlier about sending letters to par- parliament and all that other stuff like that is a tactic. Um, and it is, it is within our rights and stuff like that to, to get it on the table and all these other, uh, other things, but it's also, it's also an aggressive attack. It's also a, um, yeah. you know, it's a lot of effort and it's a lot, and it's annoying. It, it would be very, as a very annoying approach. So, you know, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. I feel like when I got my first document, first of all, uh, you know, I had conversations with Richard Dolan, Paul Hellier before he passed, he, you know, his eyes lit up when he saw this. The first thing he said to me is, who are you and why do you have this? I was like, oh, Mr. Hellier, this is. That must have been cool. <laughs> yeah. Right. So he's like, <laughs> that must so, have been really cool. Well, the document itself said no threat. Uh, and this was a UFO thing that there was a light, bright light chasing an, an aircraft. And then his, his comment was, well, it, for it to be no threat, they have to know what it is. Yeah. So, that, so, so, and that's so right. I wonder if the pilot agreed. Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> we, we don't know. And I just, so and then I talked to like other people like Randy Kramer, other people, like, I mean, that you think what you want for it with him, but like I had conversations about why, why would the military, why me, why is the military give me this? Uh, right. and then the conversation that I'm hearing is, and that's, is that they've been given, that just no one's using it. So they're kind of, mm. you know, there was kind of that test. So like, I mean, I have conversations with Otis. Uh, I mean, Otis has, has his sources. He doesn't want to give them up. Uh, he, I would give up my sources. It's just, I have confidentiality agreements. I'm doing a legitimate business. I have to protect my people. Uh, so a lot of people trust me because I can, I can give them confidentiality, uh, confidentiality agreements if, if information needs to come forward and I can be that beacon for them if they leak information to me. And I always project that. So I feel like, because Otis is like, where did you get this document? How did you say this? And how did you do this? What are you, what is your wording? And, and, and I don't think I'm wording it any differently. I, I just feel like there's a list and there's a bunch of people that are asking for it. Um, I am aware that they're aware of what I'm doing with it. And if I was doing something harmful with it, then perhaps they would stop giving me the information. Right. Um, the problem I have is I don't have enough hands to help me transcribe and put the documents up, uh, at a pace that I'd like to do it. Um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, there, there's a shift in, in, in business with Tessa. We're going to, um, we are going to make it an official media and production company. And with that, we'll be able to film and do our own documentaries, do our own shows, do our own things with our circles and stuff like that. Get the information out there. Uh, without, uh, you know, uh, doing all these other things, but then there'll be a budget, uh, that'll h- allow me to pay my current staff to, uh, escalate the process because there's steps involved. I do it all, you know, so I need help, but, uh, but people need to make money. And, and that's the other thing is the money is we can't ignore the fact that money is important here. Disclosure also would disclose the cost. And then there's that tax implication and where you're spending the money. And there's, there's so many problems with, with that and you know but if we paid people to to help then that helps but then there's that leverage there's that control there's the money is also a bad thing it's really hard to do it so uh that's why i just pay for everything i don't collect the funds i i i wanted to be in this business when i started the business it's always been my goal i'm living the dream and now with the association i'm trying to create opportunities for others to use it so the stuff that i'm talking about is open source for anyone to use and anyone to contribute. It's just that I need, I need others to put in the effort. Just let, tell me where to look or give me the documents, do that part and we'll put it up, give credit due. And in the meantime, uh, I'm just going to focus on Canada because it's an unexplored uh, area. And I see that with the, with, with my sources, like, I mean, how else did I know that uh, the thing with Kratowski? Uh, uh, the problem that I had is I'm uh, I'm not a uh, I'm not a mainstream media. I'm not a journalist. I'm not uh, I'm not famous. I'm not you know I'm just a guy in in a small town in Canada, Ontario, uh, with a problem that happened to be a big deal, and that message got around too. So, well, I mean, at some point, what we really need is we need something that's that's very grid like and very mm-hmm. very universal. And you know, if for example, I mean, this might be an old way of doing it, but like if you were, for example, to create a a network of clubs in universities and colleges, 
Mm -hmm. So you made sure that, you know, at every university, every college, you had some sort of a satellite office mm -hmm. that was able to, you know, take reports, um, you know, is able to, you know, um, notify of meetings, whatever, right? Just, uh, just some kind of a focal point and, and actually build a, build a, build a network to the point where, you know, if, if there, if some case happens in, in Wales, right. Uh -huh. And, in and, you know, that as soon as those bits can get uh -huh. across the pond, you have, you know, people here that, you know, have the choice. They don't, you know, obviously this isn't a job for most of them. So you can't, you can't force anyone, but they, as soon as that data shows up, they have a choice. They can start acting on it. And it, yeah. once we get there, it's, it's going to, it's going to, I mean, there's, so we, there's so many ways we can grow this. It's, it, we it's do only have get better. resources. It's only get better. Yeah, no, we do have, we do have resources in other countries. I'm just on disclosure. I'm focusing on Canada, but like with the civilian stuff, I have reports in, in us. I have stuff from UK. I have stuff from Australia. I have, I have contacts all over the world. The thing is that I'm, I'm like, I gotta, gotta remember that I'm private. So a journalist puts their stuff open source, radio, everything is, this is the public. I'm doing, I just don't get to, I can't show what I do privately because it's, it's confidential. But with the Experiencer Support Association, working with the experiencers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and creating and doing it in a systematic way, it doesn't matter who the source is if I'm able to link it with government documents. It's, it's about stacking the evidence. And also what I'm doing with these other countries and these other places, too, is helping them regulate the data. So with our with our classification scale, we measure it with in terms of evidence in terms of groupings so it doesn't matter how it comes to us i just repackage it and put it in a way that's in a universal language it's like the english of of classification ryan so, is, is it yeah is it still about dots in the sky and weird anomalies in the sky or is it further beyond that now when it comes to potential disclosure well th this is the scary thing is 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 and the whole reason, uh, the premise of the Experiences Bar Association is not to push for disclosure. It's to prepare for what happens after. So, so, so the abduction and like disclosure will happen. I'm, I'm, I would like it to take its time because there's still a lot of things the I need to disclosure prep Disclosure insurance. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, is as much as we want to get the answers, there's people listening that are like, you know what, if it's a UFO, that means aliens are real, which means that, uh, that, that, is, you know, sexual event that I had last night that scared the hell out of me really happened and it wasn't a dream. So there's, there, there's a lot more phenomenon going and on than look, just and let's this. all joking aside yeah that's a heavy thing to have someone go through right oh, yeah that's and a, privately we work heavy, with people yeah, and I mean, we connect them a... with uh, with with resources we have uh, we have a lot of support groups and things like that that we uh, you know and being in that firm we have uh, we have people that can help but they can't come public either because they'll lose their job but you know there's there's that stigma so for me it's not it's not that this, these machines are useless in, in the scheme of things, but as an objective investigator, because I don't know enough, I know enough about the UFOs to know that it's not important, but I don't know enough to know that I'm wrong. So I have to I have to still follow this just in case because I'm responsible right. uh, for for helping these experiencers through this experience because what's going to happen now if the United States says, yeah, we got UFOs, my job becomes a little bit easier but a little bit harder because then these people are going to think that their experience is this. And then what I'm going to have to do is be like, it might be, but I think it's something else or that doesn't have to do with this. That's something else yeah. completely. So now I'm going to yep. have to like, you know, mediate and that's what I've been doing. And by doing that, and releasing the trauma and the stresses. I'm getting better data. I'm, get, I'm getting people to come forward, willing to go on camera. Yeah, and you know, and what you're what you're touching on is is I, I really think long term we're going to see a, a massive explosion of, mm -hmm. of roles in the um, psychiatry and and mm -hmm. psychology fields. Basically, a, 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 a whole lot of professionals focused on helping you know, contactees, help, you know, focused of helping so we, people that we were have... abducted, you know, and, and that's going to end up being a, a, like the whole world is going to have to have that in spades in, so let me... I don't know how many years, like five years, 10 years, whatever it's going to happen, that has to happen where, you know, how do you get from here to there? Well, here's the thing is we're not waiting for that. We're not waiting. We're, we're, we're doing that. We actually have 
stuff in motion. So, so, so Tessa has been private for, because of my local clients and I, and wasn't sure about, you know, that taboo and losing the business. But we've recently, right. since Halloween, we, we took the opportunity to put out a campaign to introduce Tessa, the big reveal of introducing Tessa to my, to the local area, uh, is, is going to happen. And what's going to happen once it becomes public, what we're going to be doing is working with the local areas to create events um, for UFO, for paranormal, all those other things uh, with awareness. But what we're going to do is raise money and uh, for mental health, for PTSD, oh, cool. for, for all those things. So that way, what we're hoping for is that, yeah, sure, we're not, uh, you know, we don't really care about the stigma about all that other stuff. But you're raising money for us. So the UFO connection with that, with those, with those therapy yep. piece, then we start to get a little bit of that going on in the media, preparing for it. Because what we want is to be able to refer these people to actual government psychologists without, uh, uh, you know, being locked up. We want them to yeah, think yeah, yeah, that it's yeah. possible or at least have them do some CBT, uh, DBT, all those therapeutic uh, programs. Um, right. you know, and to, to help, help it accept experience or testimony, uh, that way too. And by raising money for these foundations, um, you know, that's the only way. Well, and that's that the I thing can... is it, it's, it's a little bit of everything, right? Yeah. Some, some people's sightings are their mental health. It's not a yeah. lot. It's probably a small percentage, but some percentage are some people have mental health problems and they actually saw something. Yeah, that's you, another you percentage of people, right? And then you have others. And that's the thing is, is it's not like this whole, yeah. like there's none of this and all of this. It's like, what we have is we have, it's, it's human. So it, it's going to be, mm-hmm. you know, 10% are going to be like this. Mm-hmm. 20% are going to be because of this. Some are going to be the cause of this. Some of it's mm-hmm. going to be the cause of this. And honestly, I, what I'm, what I, what I'm worried is going to happen for some people is I worry that we're going to start identifying these groupings and we're mm-hmm. going to start better categorizing things for what they are. Mm-hmm. But I think the, 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 the big story of figuring out how they're all connected and, mm-hmm. and what, what, you know, what, what the, what the big, what the big framework is, I, I have a sinking feeling that that could take a couple of decades to figure out. Like, I've already I, figured I think that might out. be huge. Like that's the thing. Oh, this ultra, wow. This ultra spectrum class, like this, there's a book that I'm like a report that I'm about to put out that will explain everything that you're looking for. I assure you that I, I, I like in, and I've broken it down to connect it all. It's a systematic way that makes absolute sense. However, I'm a, it's on the civilian side. It's not going to be, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of like, I've already created the environment that we need. What I'm doing now is trying to at least be trustworthy that that people or at least at least try to earn that trust or give that example, that opportunity. So people will trust me to 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 take what they're doing and and make it better. I'm going to facilitate that if anyone's going to leak anything, I would probably be the best source in terms of protecting your confidentiality because i i have to do that for a living i have insurance and i'm on the private side you know so like i kind of want to advocate that and we, if people do have information because i have to protect that it's not like uh you know so there, there there's these tools and resources that everyone's been missing that everybody wants i've heard your i hear it all and instead of uh, and all this time what i've been doing is building what we need instead of waiting for someone else to have it now that i have it i have to i just got to do an awareness campaign once once the pandemic's up i'm going to go back and revisit i'm going to start with falcon lake because that's what rutowski's famous for and i want to make sure that he didn't flub that up but i'm going back there dave Uh, we need to go find more people that are in his kind of roles around the country and and start trying to to, to motivate some of them to start doing this because the thing is so much of what he does for his private business really maps well to this research I mean, I in a way and on that, like the best on that weird, note gentlemen version. i gotta say good night to all of you guys because that flew by 90 minutes flew right by and uh, fedora john we'll talk to you tomorrow night and of course ryan stacy from tessacan.org the experiencer support association Really appreciate you coming on in on short notice. And we want to say a big thank you to journalist contributor of Vice, Daniel Otis, for coming on in and breaking down the Canadian side of what's happening in the world of ufology. I don't know if I fully agreed with him, 
but it was a good conversation nonetheless. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Fumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu Train has docked for the night, but soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available, your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.